Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. On this week's episode, we're going to be talking about some announcements from Play Pokemon. We'll talk about the Surging Sparks set list being released early. Another thing that was announced by Pokemon, something they normally do not do. We will, of course, have Guess That Flavor Text, everyone's favorite segments of the podcast. And we're going to wrap up this week by talking about the results from this past weekend's Louisville Regionals. And then we'll also look ahead to this coming weekend's Lille Regionals over in France. And then, of course, talk about the current meta and stuff, as I'm sure plenty of people listening have cups coming up the next couple of weekends. My name is Chip Ritchie, joined here as always by my friend and co-host, Azul GG. What's up, Azul? How we doing, buddy? How's your week been? I'm doing good, Chip. Uh, had a good weekend. Got to uh, watch Caleb get the dub, which is pretty sick. Let's and go. then did the watch party over the weekend as well for Louisville. Uh, which is pretty nice compared to the last couple because it's like literally fits right into my schedule. The stream starts up like basically as I wake up or a little bit after. So I can just kind of wake up, start up the stream and go from there and uh, did some pretty good numbers. I think I had in the finals. I had like 3000 people watching on YouTube and there was like 1500 on Twitch. So that's pretty cool. Um, so like that's like my peak numbers, I think, for 3000 on YouTube. Yeah, the YouTube that's numbers get kind of wild. The YouTube numbers get kind of kind of wild for like uh, like anything like out of the ordinary I do like any like event t- like so, like doing the show matches or the the watch party stuff like that um, Let's go. my and my goal by the end of the season is to have more viewers than the main Pokemon channel does at least on Twitch I think I can beat them on Twitch I don't think I can beat them on YouTube um, but that's the goal with the watch party so yeah I got another one coming up this weekend which is going to be way less uh, <laughs> on my schedule the stream in Lil I think starts at 1 a.m. my time. <laughs> so what are you actual, gonna do? I'm gonna try and go to bed at like 9, 10 a.m. or 9, 10 p.m. Get three or four hours of sleep and then wake up. Do it. I don't think I think staying up the whole night through would be worse than trying to get some sleep. So I'm trying to get a little bit of sleep and then wake maybe up if you it. like slept in until like afternoon the day before. Uh- I can't sleep it. My sleep schedule, like I'm pretty like set. You, my, I well, can't sleep you in. probably would have to wreck your sleep schedule leading up to it. You know. Yeah, I guess like I could like stay up super late on Thursday yeah. and then sleep in and then save. I think I would rather just try and get three or four <laughs> hours and then wake up, maybe get some caffeine involved or something, and then make it work. But I'm excited to watch another tournament because it was it was fun watching the watching Louisville throughout the weekend. Um, there's some exciting stuff, of course, that we'll talk about that would happen a little bit later in the episode. But uh, Chip, you were there. You were casting. That's right. First time in Louisville. It was my first time in Louisville. Yeah, it actually might have been my first time in Kentucky. I'm sure I have to have like driven through Kentucky at some point. I don't remember if I drive through it like because I've driven to Ohio a couple times. But it's definitely the first time I've like been in the state of Kentucky for an extended period of time. It's like one of the few East Coast states that I've like spent much time in. I guess it's like kind of borderline between east coast i mean it is east coast but it's not like it's like a little more west you know i think it's basically midwest isn't it i don't know what they call themselves well it's right it's right under ohio and indiana yeah i guess it is midwest Midwest. yeah Yeah, it's just more midwest i know for sure it was not in the south because at the catering that they (laughs) served us for uh friday or for saturday's lunch they had tea and it was not sweet tea. So I know for a fact <laughs> we were not in the South. That is one thing that is for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely Midwest area. I've been there for like a, I've been there for a League Cup, maybe two League Cups. I don't know, League Cup Louisville is two. like far. OK, my geography, I think in my head was a little off. I was thinking Louisville was on the eastern part of the state for some reason, like closer to West Virginia. It's not. It's on no, the I, don't, I don't I don't know where it is. It's closer well, to Indiana. It's like yeah. right. It's it's right outside Indiana, which I did know that. I guess so that's kind of silly on my part. To be I don't honest. know if I've. I don't think I've been to Louisville specifically. Maybe I did though. I've been to a couple of league cups in Kentucky, but I don't know if I ever made my way to Louisville specifically when I lived in uh, Indiana. But yeah. how was like? How was the casting? How was uh? It was good. It was good. I had a good time. Uh, I did. I feel like I kind of said some silly things in one of the matches, the Ian Rob versus Xander Perot match. I actually I talked to Ian in the second day of the tournament and I said, uh, do not go back and watch the game because I think I was uh, encouraging some play that would have involved him using enough Dusk Norse to 
lose the game to give Xander <laughs> enough prizes. So I maybe said something a little silly at some point along the weekend, which is a bummer. I definitely don't want to be doing that. But I think the finals overall was pretty uh, clean. It was good. I, I had a I felt pretty good about where Skarzik and I ended up by the end of the weekend as far as our like back and forth and our banter and all. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had like a little bit of a Halloween theme going on with the stream. We did a pumpkin carving contest, which somehow Kyle Sablehouse won with a pumpkin that he literally just carved John Ng's name into. I saw um, that. <laughs> uh, the uh, we we did a little uh, like costume thing on Saturday. Scarzing and I dressed up as uh, Gengar. He was Gengar. I was Mimikyu. So we were Gengar and Mimikyu tag team. Oh, I didn't make that connection at all, to be honest. But I noticed what what uh, what Pokemon you guys were. Yeah, yeah. When we rec- we did this, we recreated the the card art for a little post. It was fun. Uh, I Wait, think hang the on. best. What's up? Share your screen with me because I can't see what you. Oh, 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 my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone can it. see except me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the people listening as well. Oh, true. But you know what? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I think the one of the best costumes, though, was Rosemary and Jake and VG. They did um, Clay and Lacey from the video games, like the trainers. And I think their costumes were like on point, looked just right. And uh, it was funny, too, because Clay and Lacey are like a father daughter duo. <laughs> the chaps were killing me from Jake and walking around backstage <laughs> in the chaps with the hat with the big buckle on top. Uh, but it was fun. We got to, I, I enjoy that they let us like have a little fun, you know, with the um, with the the holiday esque um, broadcast that we do. It's like we were a little far away from Halloween, but this is the closest tournament we have to Halloween. So, yeah, we, we got to have a little fun with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's what people are like questioning in my chat. They're like, Aren't, isn't Halloween kind of like far away? And I was like, yeah, but like this is the only yeah. American Canada event that there is. Like there's no other time to for them to do the Halloween stuff. Anyways. Um, but yeah, it was fun. Uh, also, I do want to give a shout out. Someone uh, gave Boo a card to give to me. I didn't like get together with this person, but I just want to let them know that Boo got the card to me. It was a Bonds Lie, the old Diamond and Pearl one, as a gift for Samuel. So I was very kind. I very much appreciate that. <laughs> whoever you are out there that that gave that gift to me, Bonsly. That's Bonds some, Lie. That's some, Bonds Lie. That's some chip lore right there. <laughs> Um, right. but yeah, well, we can just go ahead and hop right into it, Azul, if we don't got anything else. Yeah, yeah. First order of business here is this post from Play Pokemon. So, um, I got, we didn't really talk about some of the, the public bans and stuff that have happened. And they're not public bans, but like, you know, people have made posts they made that they've been though. banned, right? Um, we didn't really talk about some of the more recent things that have happened in the community, but Pokemon did put out a statement because there's been kind of, I think, two big instances. Oh, is Can they see the, the Twitter page that I can see right now? Yes. Look under trending. Dusk Noir. D- Dusk Noir. <laughs> What's funny about that? I mean, it's just funny. I mean, I know that's like a specifically tr- like trending is specific to you, but it's just funny that it's just there because people have been talking about Dusk Noir recently. So it's like it popping up there. It's just funny. Yeah. Um, it's honestly hilarious. That's a good point. Um, yeah. <laughs> they, so, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was say this is like a response to, and I feel like hopefully, like this is a response to, I feel like this, like the thing that pushed, pushed it over the edge was probably the recent discussions around the, the bands from, uh, uh, or suspensions from uh, Michael and Ihana recently were the ones that they made public that they are suspended in the Pokemon TCG yeah. right now. So I think the things that were common threads between Michael and Ihana's bands uh, were that they, before they received a notice of suspension, uh, they both very publicly said things on uh, Twitter that people were like, their re- people's reaction to those bands were, oh, they're monitoring like what we're saying on Twitter and stuff. Like we can't even talk about our experiences at events without risk of being banned is kind of like what people's I think reaction to, cause it was like, they both said stuff on Twitter. 
then they get notice of ban and then people are like oh we can't be saying stuff on twitter because they're they're monitoring us right yeah and we'll go ahead and read through this uh to, to start off and then we'll can kind of go from there but yeah you can go ahead and yeah sure so the post is titled clarifications regarding our investigation practices october 10th 2024 we'd like to take this opportunity to provide some insight into how we handle reports and concerns within the community when issues are brought to our attention we take them seriously and conduct thorough reviews based on the information we receive we exhaust multiple sources to ensure we have the cleanest picture of the incident we possibly can including reaching out to relevant parties or individuals close to the issue we also want to reassure you, Play Pokemon does not actively monitor social media posts, but we may take them into consideration for review should they be reported to us. For more information regarding this, please see our standards of conduct, specifically Section 3. Currently, we don't share the specifics or outcomes of our reviews, regardless of the incident or action taken for privacy reasons. While we understand that this can be frustrating, we are committed to keeping those specific details between us and anyone that goes through our review process. If an individual chooses to share their notice of disciplinary action or any additional information regarding communication with our teams, that is at the sole discretion of the individual. If you are at an event and you have a negative experience, please don't have a t hesitate to report it through our support portal at support.pokemon.com. Actions that violate our posted guidelines, including our inclusion policy, may lead to disciplinary action. We are all responsible for creating a safe and positive environment for our community and therefore re review and therefore review every report sent to us. That is one of our commitments to you. We thank you for the continued support and passion of our fans, competitors, and professors in keeping our community safe spaces and respectful. While our processes are continuing to evolve, we hope that this provides at least a little more insight. We will continue toward our goal of more direct communication with you all and strive to do better for the community as we look towards the future. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I, I remember reading through this. This is definitely more geared towards what has happened most recently. Um, and, definitely. I mean, they didn't, like, say... I mean, they didn't not say anything, and this is kind of like definitely better than nothing for them to say this for sure. Um, I mean, there's still like no, like they said, they don't monitor social medias, but like still, if something gets reported to them, they're going to go look at it. So it's kind of the same yeah. thing. It's and they like did not, say that, yeah. Yeah. So it's like not like it feels like they almost want to say that to be like, because people were kind of maybe overreact like i did like a i made some memes about it myself but people were like overreacting some people were memeing about it like well you can't say anything now because then you're just gonna get banned if you say anything about anything um which isn't it's definitely not true but it's like also yeah i mean they say they're not gonna monitor they're not monitoring social media but like yeah if something gets reported they're gonna go look at it and then they're gonna take it into account so it's like it doesn't really matter one way or the other now, of course what you say matters <clears throat> in that regard as well but i feel like this doesn't really give us it doesn't give us any real clarification on like those two cases specifically. So there's not really too much to go off of uh, from that. So they didn't like really clarify anything as far as that goes. It feels like they didn't really say much. It's just like, they kind of just assured us that they are thorough with their process, which is good to know, but I guess we still don't really know what their process yeah. is. I mean, it's that's like kind of like what the bare minimum would be, right? We would assume yeah. before they suspend someone from play that they would do stuff a thorough pro like they would have a thorough process right it's kind of yeah. it would be kind of scary if they didn't have at least a semi-thorough process um now this is also stuff like i don't know man like it can just be it's it, yeah it, without knowing specifics it's impossible to know how thorough thorough is by their definition right yeah, I'm going to assume that they do like a decently thorough process, but it would still be, I don't know, it'd still be nice to have more clarification than that because then it's it's really hard to go off of more. And this is what I've been saying with people, players who get like, um, was it like DQ'd or banned at recently and like, like the things we had at the end of last season. I'm like, because we know we're not going to get anything from TPCI, I'm fully open to just like believing whatever the players say for the most part. So in these situations, there are like other things you can kind of do similarly where you can go off of what, the the people who uh the people in the situations for their suspensions like what they have said you can kind of just go off of that and kind of make your judgment call because we know you're not going to get anything from tbci and they've basically confirmed with this that they're not going to release any statement ever in these kind of situations i don't know it just seems like 
it seems like it would be a good thing for them to say something, even if like people disagree with their conclusion that resulted in the suspension of a player. I feel like still being transparent is a positive. I just feel like it can never be a negative. It feels like it, like some of the community might dislike them more, but I think overall, especially for someone like me, the way I kind of view these kind of things, like that would be like a big step in the right direction for someone like me when I look at this kind of situation. Because otherwise, all I all I read from this is like I'm just more inclined to like. I mean, whatever the players say is kind of what we still have to go with. We just know you're never going to say anything on any of these situations. So I don't know. It doesn't really add too much in terms of more. There's no more transparency coming out of this, and it's basically confirming. Yeah. It's basically confirms there won't be more transparency moving forward. Right. Which is so interesting too, because. Remember when after Hartford Regionals, there was like that the incident, everything that happened with Rowan and stuff. And then they did eventually put out a post, right, saying that they yeah. had done their own in investigation and that they didn't believe there was any reason to, you know, act any further and stuff like that. They they said all that without saying anyone's name. And I think that is part of this. Right. Which I do like uh, understand and respect. Right. Like. Someone uh you know making you know saying something online and then getting it getting reported to pokemon uh and then pokemon putting out a public statement about it like stuff around this like i don't know that it should <laughs> affect like people's abilities to like seek employment and stuff in the future and these are the type of things that like would come up if a company does a background check on someone right um like the rowan situation right they told us what happened or what they that they believed like a, nothing that not enough had happened. Right. Or I don't yeah. remember exactly what the specifics were without saying his name. So now he is never tied to that in any sort of like background check, any employment yeah. and stuff like that in the future. Right. Which I think is a, a very important piece of this and probably why they just want to be consistent across the board and not be putting out statements that have people's names attached to them. But they had remember that I think I saw Nico like retweeted the thing that they, put out a while ago that was like their commitment to yeah it was more like, transparency and that came out after the makani situation like the right. situation happened they were yeah. like we're, we're gonna make we we're making an announcement about making future announcements and they've made one since then when it seems like there's other situations that have come up where it's like it just i feel like a lot of it just comes down to how much does the community like they don't have to make a statement for every dq and every band but ones where the community is definitely questioning what is going on um and and is kind of asking for some transparency on like a bigger level like i feel like has been asked uh around the situations that we have most recently happened um and stuff like that i feel like there's like what are you waiting for like and i think it would just be like such a good like a good gesture to the community even if you disagree with how they came to their conclusion if they are more transparent about it like i think that's still such a big deal that it's such it's so it would make such a difference if we knew if there was ever a big deal in the community that tpci would make a statement on it eventually and we just have to wait for it and then we'll get more clarity and can kind of make our judgment from there instead we just basically everyone kind of jumps the gun a little bit and like immediately makes our judgment just based on the information that the players put out there but i can't really fault the players too much for that either because we know there's nothing else coming and they basically right. just confirmed there's nothing else coming yeah these kind of situations because it felt like this was maybe this was like this statement came out more around the idea of like stuff that happens at actual events, like in the moment that is like, because it feels like the stuff that happened most recently was kind of like post event. Um, and then they still haven't made announced. The only thing they've talked about ever is the Rowan thing. Like they never made a statement about like, there was the guy who got DQ'd at NAIC last year with the Mark sleeves. No statement. There's the guy who got yeah. DQ'd at NAIC this year. Noah for the alleged stacking, no statement. Right. It's these like, these are, are these are all great in, uh, examples of ways like and there's been people DQ'd from you know regionals and other things, right? That um, there's been no statements about. Yeah, yeah, and I think it really just comes down to how big it gets into the community, as if they need to make a statement about them. If it's smaller and like you know, if it's something that like happens and like the community at large doesn't seem to care or know about, I think it does matter less. Um. But I think it does when when it is like something that's being more talked about in the community to create that trust between TPCI and the community when it seems like the community cares enough to talk about it to the point that they are. It seems like it would be nice if TPCI responded to those situations. Um, also, public ban list would be pretty good, too. But I don't think they're I don't know if they're ever going to do that moving forward. But that would be pretty good. It would be pretty good. But I mean, they've existed for as long as they have without a public ban list. I can't 
expect that we will be seeing it anytime soon. Yeah, I wonder what the reason is for that. I guess it's like a, yeah, it's like another form of lack of transparency. Yeah. Well, speaking of transparency, there was another update. Um and this is a, a positive one, right? And uh, that is the uh fact that there is now a landing page on Gaming Gin's website, the organizer of all the U.S. regional events, that has a scheduled registration opening with an asterisk, of course, saying that these times are subject to change. But this is something, Azul, you were putting a lot of pressure out there saying that this is something you felt like really needed to be happening. And Chris Brown, who is the director of global esports and events and producer at Pokemon, you know, tweeted out that this is something that is live now. What are your thoughts as someone who was uh, really outspoken about this this issue? I mean, I don't want to give them too much credit because I feel like this is something that should have existed. Now, this is going to like a little bit step further almost than like I think is necessary. Like we don't need to know when expected registration opens for Milwaukee, right? We could know that. You could tell us that a month before it happens. That's telling them telling us right now isn't a bad thing. I'm not yeah. saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying so that is like a step further. Um, but they're they're still missing like a big some big connections here, right? Did Gaming Gen even tweet out that this page is live? Like I saw it from Chris Brown, but I don't even know if Gaming Gen did Gaming Gen make a tweet? They retweeted Chris Brown's tweet. All right, it feels like they should have their own tweet, probably. Um and they also did <laughs> tweet out today that Toronto registration is tomorrow, which is if you're listening to the podcast the day it comes out, is today. So surprise, if you're trying to go to Toronto Regionals, you better be ready to register at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Literally 12 hours after the podcast is going to be going live, registration for Toronto is going live. Um, and the biggest thing that they're missing still, though, is there's no connection from, like, if you Google Pokemon Regionals 2025. You go to that landing page for special events and regionals, there's no breadcrumb. There's not even, like, a breadcrumb trail to get to, like, this landing page or to know what RK9 is or yeah. to know when or where to look for registration times and who the tournament organizer is. So, that this page existing is good. But people, not in the future, like we know about it now because it's like a hype new thing. And this is a place where people can tell people to go, which is a good thing as well. But people aren't going to be able to find this page on their own. I don't think people are going to be able to find this on their own. So we're still missing a lot of uh, information. No, because no one knows about Gaming Gen. No one knows Gaming Gen is the organizer behind these regionals. Like, um, unless you're like kind of like if you're in the know, but if you're in the know, you know when registration is dropping for tournaments anyways. But we want people who are not in the know to be able to find this information without being in the know. But this this information is not like also you out can't there. I can't get from here to Arcanine. How do I get really? to Toronto registration <laughs> or regionals registration? Is there no connection, dude? This is just insane. All right, so is it there once again dropping the ball? I didn't even. I just kind of assumed I can click on be. Sacramento and I can go click on registration. Oh my gosh! Uh, do they have they don't have like a page like this for Toronto yet. Is it here at all? um all events no, no it's not you're here yeah all right Let's see hang on hang on okay what if i do this i go up here the url is slash regional slash sacramento what if i type in slash toronto oh but we spectator registration they got something there and it just reopens oh this page. my gosh <laughs> all right this is like a failure bro come on <laughs> Oh, it's worse. I was like, okay, there's something here. But now that the more we do, the more we try and mess around with it, there's like nothing here. You don't even know where to go. If you can get to this page, where do you go? <laughs> you just know it happens. You don't know where it happens. <laughs> Imagine no... seeing this and being yeah. like, oh, okay, I'll be back on this page at 7 p.m. October 7, 16th. Yeah, I mean, maybe tomorrow they will have like one of these yeah, little, yeah, yeah. the Sacramento, Louisville, Baltimore. So we'll see. Um, there might be one of those up there available. Um, but it would be nice to be able to like already go over to Arcanine, right? Because you have to make an account and you have to yeah. like get your information set up. It'd be nice to already have that connection established. Because if someone if someone looks at Sacramento, Louisville, and Baltimore, they're like, oh, I'm not going to those. Why would I click on view de details to go over to Arcanine? Like, right? No one's gonna do that. So they still got like this is something, but it is not enough. So I don't want to give them like props. I'm not trying to give them props here because it's something that should have already existed, and yeah. it's not even that good. It's like it's like okay, um, they still have a lot of work to do um so yeah i'm not trying to give them props or anything like that but this is now a resource it at least shows you can utilize like, they're, everyone who's listening it shows they're kind of listening right like at least somewhat or maybe people support ticketed about the issue that i guess could also be the possibility right i guess they don't monitor social media so it might have to have come from the support tickets yeah um 
yeah i guess now um now you got that page to use as a resource for anyone who's listening regionals.gaminggen.gg <laughs> look at the replies like huge quality of life improvement thank you so much this is a me amazing thank you chris brown and then mike says good job azul <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah this is but they, this is like still pretty lacking and it's not about like and you see like the the i'm not like uh hating on Rahul or Lasage here, but these these are two players who are in the know. This does not matter to them at all. You have to think about the players who just are have are going to stumble their way to try and figure out, oh, I have a local... Like, someone literally in my chat the other day was like, oh, wait, there's a major tournament this weekend? Or last week was like, oh, there's a major tournament in my hometown? I didn't know about that for Louisville. They are like, oh, there's a major tournament happening in my... I live here. I didn't know there was a major tournament happening this weekend in my hometown um so if they like if someone like heard about that you know a month before the tournament was happening we we want them to be able to stumble into the registration process right yeah um but it seems like that's just like hard it's hard to do that there's no there's no there's no breadcrumb trail there's not even a breadcrumb trail it feels like it should be more obvious than that but at the very least there should be like some kind of breadcrumb trail um um yeah so like i said like people like lasage and rahul responding here it's like uh it's yeah this isn't like a bad thing that exists of course it's a good thing that it exists i don't want to give gaming gen props or tpci props because this is something that should have already existed but like we need to be thinking heavily about the people who are not in the know those are the people that matter i don't matter as far as these processes go uh, people like rahul and massage don't matter chip doesn't matter because we we know when these things are going to be happening it's about the people who don't know when they're going to be happening we need to be just like a smooth process for them to get all this information yeah maybe uh you know, in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about, you know, the they, they've maybe added a little bit of a breadcrumb trail. Who knows? Yeah, we'll see. Baby steps. Maybe they, maybe they monitor podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does this count as social media, the podcast? Um, I don't know. How does that, what are people calling like YouTube these days? Is that social media? YouTube is like, I think technically a social media platform, right? Okay. Yeah, I guess. I was actually curious. I just went on the event locator just to see if they've added anything and it looks like they've added it they've added bogota special event and lil regional championships i don't think those were here before i was just curious if they've changed anything on on here i was complaining about that oh sacramento's here now because that's the one i was complaining about sacramento is there but it's past registration so i don't even know if it matters is registration full for sacramento i kind of assume it is but i'm actually not sure um i don't know actually Yeah, that's interesting. Why why do all of these events not have event pages already? Well, you can click on them. Wait, what do you mean event pages? Like why are why are the future uh regionals not have pages like this? Why does not every single one oh, yeah, schedule not have this? That's yeah, that was one of the things I was complaining about in my my video I put out on Twitter a little while ago. It's like you can like it says it even says in like the uh on the uh Pokemon regionals and special events landing page, like it says Many regional championships require online registration and events may sell out. Please check the event locator for details about each event, including information regarding registration. And then, so they have like a, like that actually is the information that should be good enough. That's actually fine. It's like, okay, you, you make your way to Pokemon regionals and special events page and you're like, oh, event locator, click on event locator, find the event I want to go to from the list of events. And it's not there. And now I don't know where to go. You just get kind of stuck. Now you have to go Google like Sacramento regional championships. 24 or something but i don't know just like there's no connection for the process still so still things to work on in um in that realm for sure We're not done yet well another thing that was kind of a surprising announcement uh was the official reveal of the entire set list for surging sparks um which is not something that they have done before. So pre-releases for this set release start next weekend. The set release is Friday, November, uh, November the 8th. So we are just over two and a half weeks away from that date. And this uh, website, the po Pokemon TCG card gallery, um has been updated with surging sparks so i mean this is a, a much earlier than normal reveal of these cards in english yeah i wonder why they did oh and hopefully that's something that they consistently do 
it is kind of lining up a little bit, not quite exactly, with the release of Supercharged Breaker over in Japan, which comes out this Friday, I believe. So, like, we would, like, basically know all the cards completely. But I think the final cards were revealed from Supercharged Breaker, like, just a couple of uh, days ago. Mm, so it so maybe it sense. lines up with that. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. makes sense, like, okay, the final cards are revealed. Now we can publish it on our site, right? Yeah, and hopefully that's like a... I feel like Pokemon's done these things in the past where they actually do something kind of cool and it feels like forward thinking um, and something the community would like to have as far as information and stuff goes. And then they just don't do it when the situation comes up again. So we'll have to see if they do this again with the next set. But I feel like there's been things in the past where they do something like this where it's like, oh, that's cool. They put the official set list out. They got the uh, the cards on there with the cool animations. And then next set's going to drop and then this is going to come out like on set release or like after or something it's gonna be like okay well last time was kind of cool that you did that ahead of time what happened like why why not this time yeah we'll, we'll wait and see but it is it is cool to like have everything we know everything right which is kind of cool you know the full set list confirmed all the cards are gonna be getting in a, a couple weeks now yeah yeah i mean because i feel like normally like this is around the time when um pre-release kits start going to stores like in the next week or so and then the full set list kind of gets revealed anyway right yeah as people like leak it out there so maybe this is them almost even getting a little bit ahead of that i could see that yeah and like you may as well like if we like yeah because we do know like i looked on uh justin basil's site and basically the whole set list has been filled out like what what he'll do it looks like is like he fills out the set list as cards get revealed and kind of pieces it together um and then like leaves question marks in the ones that were blank but i looked like sometime last week and it was it was basically just fully filled out so yeah. we basically know pretty far ahead of the time so it is nice that they're just kind of giving us the information confirming it and then i don't know giving us like a nice landing page to look at all the new cards that are coming out as well I do like this getting out there early as well from uh, myself as a caster's perspective because I I try not to look too much at the fan translations and stuff because oftentimes what they translate attack names as is not what the actual attack yeah. name ends up actually translating to. And so sometimes like a card will come out and then go read. for months I'll be like calling it the wrong ability name or like a trainer card I'll call the wrong thing. Like Cypher Maniac's code breaking, I still sometimes call it like a uh, crypto maniac or or uh something like that. Go and read what they uh ended up calling the cat toy card. I saw that. I don't remember it off the top of my head. The chill teaser toy. <laughs> Dude, what does that even mean? Bro, it's chill. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to the unchill like <laughs> what is that it's like what, what it's a teaser what? toy that chills the cat out okay so it chills the cat out or is it one that is chill like the other ones it's are chill. less chill um yeah that was that was like a, i was like i don't know i mean the other name was like weird too the initial translation was like relaxy or something relaxer teaser toy or something but the it being called chill is also weird also this website uh i don't know that i've ever really clicked around on it before i think it's existed but yeah. this is pretty cool how you can like look at all the cards and get like a forced like a perspective view of each of them they flip in and out this low key looks better than TC tcg live <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's close it's close for sure um definitely not bad um but yeah it was cool that they put this out and with this as well there were a few cards that got revealed in japanese over the weekend that we're seeing here in english for the first time so i figured we could go ahead and talk about some of the new cards that we have not spoken about on the podcast just yet um and the first one that is new to us is this durant ex it's 190 hp grass type basic ex pokemon weak to fire to retreat it has the ability Sudden Shearing. When you play this Pokemon from your hand onto your bench during your turn, you may discard the top card of your opponent's deck. And then it, uh, for a Grass and two Colorless, has the attack Vengeful Crush, 120+. plus. This attack does 30 more damage for each prize card your opponent has taken. Yeah, so I think the best way to probably incorporate this card is, like, it'll be, like, in, like, some kind of controller mill deck as, like, a, a mill function, like with Penny. Like sudden shearing, penny it up, pass. Bench it, sudden shearing, penny it up, pass. 
and like repeat as like a sped up win a mill win condition maybe but that's like the best use case i can kind of see for it i know everyone sees this and goes like oh it ko's charizard everything ko's charizard we don't need anything else that ko's charizard everything is ko charizard for sets charizard is still KOing you first so yeah i don't think durant is the the answer to charizard the the 10th answer to charizard we've had in like three sets it's not not that but as some kind of like interesting mill win condition and some kind of like lock deck you trap their active and then start milling them also i do real quickly just want to read this executor here 130 hp stage one grass type pokemon weak to fire to retreat it has the attack barrage o'clock <laughs> 60x this flip a coin for each energy attached to both active pokemon this attack does 60 damage for each heads and the cost is just one grass energy let's go yeah. you'll love to see it and the reason chaos charizard yeah, the reason that Durant's not the answer to Charizard is because it's Executor. That's Let's right. go. <laughs> the Barrage O'Clock bonking Charizards left and right, shutting them all down. Uh, uh, I wanted to shout this card out just because it reminds me of this old Executor from Fire Red Leaf Green with the big egg explosion attack, 40x, flip a coin for each energy attached to Executor. This attack does 40 damage times the number of heads. This was actually low key, it wasn't great. But it was not a terrible deck back in like 2005, I want to say, 2004, 2005, where you would just use an Electro DX, blow it up, put a bunch of energy on this thing, like double rainbows and scrambles and uh, flip a bunch of coins and one hit KO, whatever your opponent's active was. I assume you just get knocked out back. You only got 80 HP. I mean, stuff was a lot smaller back then, buddy. All right. All right. I can see it. Big, big explosion. Big explosion. Barrage O'Clock. Uh, next up here, we've got a Victini with this ability. Victory Cheer. Attacks used by your Evolution Fire Pokemon do 10 more damage to your opponent's active Pokemon. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like one of those, like, niche tech cards. Yeah. I'm sure we'll, this will see play eventually in some Evolution Fire deck. We just got to kind of wait for the right one. Um, I don't think there's anything right now that kind of, like, stands out to me. Charizard is not a fire type. Yeah. And I mean, there's like the new Cell uh, Sarah Ledge coming out, but discarding an extra basic energy is probably just better and saving the bench space. So, yeah, I don't think Sarah Ledge X is going to play this. I don't think there's really anything that plays this right now, but at some point in the future, probably. Yep. Kind of a, you know, it's kind of like how Zapdos has been played in Maridon, right? It's yeah. just that like basic math fixer like this type of card will probably be good at some point or probably find a place in. i shouldn't say be good but find a place in something you know at some point yeah it's a format the one one of format with evolution fire pokemon come out i'm sure there'll be a meta where it makes its way into a deck we've got a new rotom here an 80 hp lightning type pokemon weak to fighting one retreat and it has two attacks the first one for one lightning energy crushing pulse your opponent reveals their hand discard all item cards and pokemon tool cards you find there and then another lightning energy energy short 20x this attack does 20 damage for each energy attached to your opponent's active pokemon yeah i mean that first attack i'm sure control players are interested in it i mean we we do stop eerie right like eerie gets rid of items two items like how many how many good items does your opponent have right Dude, this card is definitely pretty good in a control deck it seems fine discard all item cards it seems okay oh man <laughs> like getting it out into the active like yeah if you just think of it like decks can expend their items pretty aggressively on turn two you know even if you're a rare candy deck like if you catch like charizard using rotom and you can attack with this before they get their turn sure but after that like decks like charizard expend their items stuff like raging bolt would be a deck where this probably lines up a little bit better but then like even then like i don't even know what your other win conditions are into the matchup besides just taking away some retrievals so it's not like a bad card for sure it's okay uh, i did go through like my surging sparks uh buy list on stream today um before we uh filmed this and it did make its way onto my buy list as a one of but you know it's it's a cute control resource disruption oh, you're card. really trying to save people money right you definitely don't need more than one but like it is a common card like you should just buy four copies of the three cent card i mean yeah i guess maybe i don't know that's when i like think about my bias i'm always trying to like minimize as much as much as possible just like the sure what i think you just want to have but like you probably will never need more than discount of it but you are right it probably will never be played 
is more than a one of. I mean, think okay. about how strong Luxray V has been in decks before. Now, granted, that can take away any trainer card. Yeah, um, and it's a little bit bigger, so it and it doesn't die. get KO'd immediately. Sure, sure. Um, there's also we, we could talk about the GM. We didn't talk about the GM Pal before, did we? we? Could mention the GM Pal real fast because it's a. I don't know that we've talked about it. An ability coming back. When you play this Pokemon from your hand onto your bench during your turn, you may discard a stadium in play. We had Pumpkaboo a little while ago that did literally the exact same thing. Mm. Had, the Pumpkaboo had two or three costs, though. He's kind of thick. Bro, put some respect on his name. <laughs> we got the good old Tauros. Oh, uh, I don't even know what this one is. Crush Chance. Do people play this? Uh, I think so. Once during your turn, when you put Taurus from your hand onto your bench, you may discard a stadium in play. Was this at the same time as that stadium that shut down Pidgeot? Uh, yeah, Battle Frontier, yes. But that only shut down Evolution. It only metal. shut down Evolved Colorless Pokemon, yeah. So Tauros could bump the stadium. Yes. So Tauros is our Pumpkaboo, or Tauros to what's it called is our Pumpkaboo to Path to the Peak. Yeah. And now they gave us this Champau. Now, we don't have a stadium like Path to the Peak in the format. That Chi and Pao can really go after. But like even stuff like Pokestop before you Iono your opponent, it's kind of nice to bump that. I and mean, I feel like most of the time you'd rather commit the spot that this fills up to with like, a stadium. An actual stadium, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or vacuum. Um the the way for a card like this to be played is if there is some disruptive stadium in the format, most likely. Yeah. Also, it depends how much Pokemon search you play as well, right? Because you that's another sure. way you can find it. You can't ultra ball for lost vacuum. Uh, next up, we've got the NDD. Or, yeah, where's the NDD? Did I go past it? Uh, no, it's lower. I think. Uh, there it is. Okay. Well, let's do let's do Dedenne first. Then it's got a colorless attack, electromagnetic sonar. Put a trainer card from your discard pile into your hand. Wait, that's the same attack as the Lucky, right? Literally the exact yeah. same name. Alecky's leaving us though. Yeah, so we had to bring Dedenne in, of course. So, like, we need to replace. <laughs> if there's one thing we need constantly in the format, it's electromagnetic sonar. Um, so another, like, honestly, they're giving us like a lot of uh, niche control slash stall slash like alternate win condition cards. The Rotom, this Dedenne, the Durant. They really want Sander to. <laughs> they're giving him Dedenne. plenty of cards to work with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are the only cards that Sander actually buys. You know, he doesn't even own a Teal Mask Ogre Pond. Like, <laughs> but he'll have four Dene's. <laughs> yeah. Just in case. Sander's probably, if Sander ever listens, he's like, what are they talking about? This card sucks in control. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got Indeedy here with the Obliging Heal. When you place Pokemon from your hand onto your bench during your turn, you may heal 30 damage from your active Pokemon and have it recover from a special condition. This is actually another reprint we've had this before on a audino it maybe only healed Whoa. 10 damage though it only healed 10 damage and it also it did not have to get benched oh it did yeah it had to i bench know it. i think you just discarded it buddy what was it oh that would be that'd be pretty good once during your turn if this pokemon is in your hand you may reveal it if you do heal 10 damage in a special condition oh. from your active pokemon then discard this pokemon it was better it was way better i would yeah I, I know about this card because or i remember this card because Prior to Nationals, the one where the Excel Gore deck was really good, I think. we were uh, Me and my uh, friends were testing this in Lugia to beat them. I think Dylan Bryan played four of this card in the Flareon in deck. His the... Flareon deck, because you could discard it. What is it not? You can just discard it no matter. Wait, it, no, but if you have to heal it, right? If you, if you, you may do, reveal you it. can reveal oh, it. you can just discard it. Wait, did you sure really you play four of these? It. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Let's double check on PTCG Legends. Worlds that year was after the, the year where Excel Gore did really well at Nationals, but Excel Gore was a terrible play for Worlds. Yep. Yep, you just discard them. And also beat Excel Gore, I guess. Dude, this deck was so weird. <laughs> this he always played, deck? He played weird decks, though. This it's is your like, go, bro. He's got just so much squad. Like, there's so much squad in here. Tracking, of course, you need that. You need <laughs> the three enhanced. You need the three enhanced hammer. That's how you set up your Drifloon. Only two Pokemon catcher. Only need two. Is it? Was it a flip back? That wasn't. Was it a, was it a nope. flip? Oh, did it get eroded before? It must have gotten eroded. 
I don't know if we were flipping or not. We'll check someone else's list. If everyone had catchers in it, then we weren't flipping, probably. Oh, yeah. No, Jason. Yeah, we were not flipping. Oh, we were, we're not flipping. flipping. We we're not flipping. Just two. I mean, you probably, you're you one prize deck, so that you probably only need two. Um, I yeah, maybe I you're know. not one-hit KO in the two-prize Pokemon. I feel like we got to bring some boys back up. Yeah, that's why we have two. Just a couple times. Not all the oh, time. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. This was definitely a... I remember watching uh, him versus he played. He played against Jason in top sixteen. Yeah, it's on stream. You can still watch that video on uh, oh, yeah, the YouTube channel. I think. Uh, right. But yeah, there's the Ndidi. Um, we've got the. I think the only other thing is this TM machine. Where is that? Oh, that might be that might be next set actually. Oh, it's not in here. No, are they getting it over in? Are they I getting think, in Supercharged Breaker? Um, it might be like a promo. Dude, another one of these situations where Japan is just going to have a card that we're not going to have for like two sets. Yeah, it is a gym promo. TM Machine. Search your deck for up to three Pokemon tool cards with Technical Machine in their name. Reveal them and put them into your hand. Then shuffle your deck. Now, granted, I don't think this card is super good. No, but I think it's like the... What is like the word I'm looking for? It's the... Principle. Is, principle of the thing yeah like when are we getting this card and why do we not have it when japan is having it like in this in this at least this kind of lineup where it's like we're getting all of their paradise dragona and supercharged breaker cards and they're getting this card in that time frame it feels like we should get this card in our set and the fact that we don't have it feels off um obviously it's not great but there's just been, i feel like there's been cards in the past though that where japan has them and we don't have them and they are pretty good um, there's also another. Is, is the other card go back real fast? Is the Ravska EX also one of these cards? Yeah, it is also oh, it a is. gym promo. Another way to KO Charizard, everyone's favorite. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets there. Grass and double colorless for tw uh, 20 plus 90 more for each energy attached to your opponent's active Pokemon. Charizard will have two energy on it. So, boom, boom. Very nice. Bye bye, Charizard. We got him again. Somebody said it's like somebody said make a deck which is every every hey this chaos Charizard card in the <laughs> format. <laughs> Maybe that's the way the way a grass deck can be good. Like no one's just tried it yet. You have to put all the grass Pokemon together. Yeah, and then they show up to a tournament and play against twelve Charizard players, and that's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Go twelve and zero into cut. Yeah, so sick. And then play against <laughs> Raging Bolt and lose in three minutes. <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> Has ever had like a run like that where they actually hit like an absurd amount of one deck? Like, oh, I'm sure at some point, especially in like the like Lugia broken. format, yeah, but that's different. Like, in more like, like even like Raging Bolt at Louisville was 15%. Like, did someone out there hit like eight Raging Bolt, six Raging Bolt, 12 or rounds or something? Yeah, really interesting to see some people's like ridiculous runs in terms of uh what They're, what decks they match up against yeah the good old matchup roulette right yeah except the roulette is just always raging bolt <laughs> <laughs> all right well those are all the new cards um it's cool to see the card gallery popping up this is like also a cool like way to uh like get proxies and stuff printed i feel like if you're trying to test cards for the new sets there's some better ways than that right now i think pokemon pokemon proxies to get some images well, I mean, this yeah. is like you. I mean, it's the same thing, effectively. Like, and you'll I at think... least be saying the right attack names and stuff. Oh, true. I guess that's true. Like, it is fully trained. Can you even can you download the image? You can, I assume. Well, I right click it, it goes small again. Or what happens if you write a new tab? There it is. There it is. Young that looks Blade. pretty good too. I'm sure it is like the full. It's the official. This might be where PKM and cards gets their card images from. To be honest. Mm, could be have they added it no they have not added it mm. maybe not then where you tried the new houndstone ex yet nope i do need to get me some of those though i don't have that card yet mm -hmm. i have four of everything just in case all right well Azul, i think we can move on here to everyone's favorite segment but of course before we do we got to take a second to thank our fantastic sponsor dragon shield for supporting us here at the Uncommon Energy Podcast. Dragon Shield makes some of the best card gaming and tabletop gaming products and accessories on the market. 
And of course, we love them and use their sleeves uh, exclusively when Azul and I are playing in Pokemon events, which uh, I guess Azul hasn't been really doing too much of <laughs> these days. No, uh, next month though, Sacramento, I'll be rocking out the yellows again. I got the Dragon Shield yellows behind me, so I'm he's ready, ready, to ready to be. Go. He's ready to be resleeving every single round. Not every single round, maybe every other round. Um, <laughs> So shout out to Dragon Shield as always sponsoring us here on the podcast. The link of course will be in the description. You can use code UEPOD, get yourself five percent discount, and directly support us here as well. Get yourself stocked up for the rest of the season through the end of the year. Get the trading card fan in your life a nice gift for the upcoming holidays, whatever your needs may be. They can uh, hook you up at Dragon Show. I actually need to go order some sleeves. I got to get, uh, I want to get some classics. I looked at the website the other day and saw that they had a bunch of classics in stock on the site. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go stock up, I think. You're a classics fan? Oh, of course. <laughs> That's literally what everyone used back in the day in my area when I literally lived every time I bring them up, you talk about that. I do. Yeah. It was literally the sleeve. It's the go to. They did not have yellows last time I looked, though, which is the color I used to always use. Classic yellows. All right. Well, thanks a bunch, Dragon Shield. And we can now move on to Guess That Flavor Text, everyone's favorite segment of the podcast, where each week Azul or I will pick a Pokemon card, read the flavor text from it, and then have the other host try to guess which Pokemon is featured on that card. You do, of course, have a few lifelines you can use to help you out. Those lifelines are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and read an attack name. If you don't use any lifelines, you get four points for each lifeline you use you lose access to a point. I am currently leading by a pretty decent margin here, 32 to 25. I do kind of regret not just spiking the, the four-pointer last week because I did off the rip, guess it correctly, but used a few lifelines to whittle it down just to make sure. Azul, it's my turn to pick a card for you. Are you ready? I'm ready, Chip. Hit me with it. Here we go. It spits fire that is hot enough to melt boulders. It may cause forest fires by blowing flames. Um, man, I'm not sure. For some reason, the Pokemon that immediately came to mind was Larvesta. Is that the one I'm thinking of? Is that the basic? Basic little the, bug. Yeah, I don't know why that one came to mind immediately. There's a lot of Pokemon that probably spit fire. I don't know, like, spitting fire is different than, like, breathing fire. And Larvesta is a bug. Um, and I, You know, I got so much ground to make up here. I kind of want to lock in Larvesta immediately and just go with it. But maybe I should use a... Uh, spits fire. If I ask, I'm, of course, like, I always feel like using the lifelines probably isn't going to help me when I'm in these situations. But then it does sometimes help me. But maybe I should just, like, lock in Larvesta and then... That are, are, read me the flavor text one more time. It spits fire that is hot enough to melt boulders. It may cause forest fires by blowing flames. It does say blowing flames, but it also says spit. But I guess you could think about... Well, like I don't think like Charmander spits fire. Although, does it? I guess it could. Charmander could be spitting fire. But it feels like that is like leaning more towards like something that a bug Pokemon would do, like a Larvesta. <sighs> All right, let's use... A lifeline here. What stage is the card? It is a stage two. Okay, so it's not Larvesta. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> Good thing I used a lifeline here. What stage two fire Pokemon is spitting? All right, life, uh, give me the, the thing one more time. It spits fire that is hot enough to melt boulders. It may cause forest fires by blowing flames. I mean, it could be. Uh, what is the coal Pokemon? The stage two coal Pokemon. It talks about boulders. Colossal. Colossal, maybe. I don't think so. All right, what set is the card from? It is from Pokemon Go. I think there's a colossal in Pokemon Go. I guess I don't know if it's a fighting fire. Po if it's a fighting Pokemon. Or if it's a fire Pokemon. I mean, it's definitely a fire Pokemon, but I don't know if it's like... Yeah, sure, in the TCG. Fire, yeah, in the TCG, if it's fire or fighting. All right. Uh, attack name. I guess I need an attack name here. Flare Blitz. 
Jeez. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming up short. Is it is there Charizard? Is that just Charizard? Who else has Flare Blitz? Not no one that I can think of. Is it just Char? Is there a Charizard in Pokemon Go? There's Char Radiant Charizard. Is there a Charizard EX in Pokemon Go as well? Maybe there is. Maybe there's not. I don't remember. Uh, I don't think there's an EX. I don't think. That, I don't think there would be a non. Dude, I'm kind of stumped now. Flare Blitz. All right, I need the life. I need the <laughs> flavor text one more time. This has got to be it, buddy. This Come is on, last time. All right, it spits fire that is hot enough to melt boulders. It may cause forest fires by blowing flames. Dude, I don't know. I'm stumped on this one. May cause forest fires by blowing flames. Melt boulders. It's spitting fire. It's a stage two. Definitely a fire Pokemon. Not colossal. All right, buddy. Dude, I don't even know. What is a fire Pokemon that's a stage two? I mean, I don't want to say Charizard. And it has Flare Blitz as an attack. Flare Blitz. And there's so many fire Pokemon that have Flare Blitz. I can't think of anyone in Pokemon Go. Stage two fire type Pokemon from Pokemon Go with the attack Flare Blitz. A Charizard. Locking it in? Sure. Puzzle. It is Charizard. Oh <laughs> it is Charizard. Let's go. You got there eventually. Okay. There's, isn't there a, isn't this a reprint? No. Isn't there a, isn't there a different Charizard that has Burn Brightly, or is this the Burn Brightly Charizard? This is the Burn Brightly Charizard. Oh, okay. I don't know why. I, I was thinking it did. I was thinking that one did not. Like that one came through my head, but I was like, that one didn't come out in Pokemon Go. I don't think it did. I was like, yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> not bad. When I picked this one, I thought he's not going to be able to get it right away. But I feel like if he uses some lifelines, he might be able to get there. And it did take all the lifelines and it did take about seven, eight minutes. But <laughs> you did eventually get there. Well done. Well done. All to guess Charizard. All right. I was going to laugh so hard if you were like when you said it doesn't sound like Charmander. Yeah, I don't know. Well, Spitfire, I don't, when I'm thinking of Spitfire, I'm not thinking about, like, breathing fire, but I guess it's kind of, like, the same thing, like... Yeah. Yeah. So, in my head, I was like, ooh, maybe Larve like, that maybe sounds like what would work with Larvesta if it's, like, you know, it's like a bug. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it fits a little bit more, but... Well, it's a good thing I stuck around for some of the, the lifelines in it, lock in Larvesta. That's True. I, well. I was gonna laugh so hard. Because <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's not gonna be able to get this, but he's gonna use some lifelines, and he'll be able to get there from that. Yeah. Just took a little while. All right. Well, as well, let's move on to the main topic of our show today, and that is the results from Louisville Regionals. We've got the Lille Regional Championships also coming up this weekend in Europe over in France. But before we talk about the actual results of the tournament, I think kind of the biggest story, obviously, you know, I, the biggest story we always got to give props to the winner, and especially in this case, because it is our friend Caleb Gettimer getting the win. So very big congratulations to Caleb. But I think the bigger story for a lot of people is the result around the standings. And what we mean by that is throughout the course of the season, there were – or before the start of the season, there were changes to the tournament structure – they told us that there was going to be less Swiss rounds in day two for events, potentially less in day one, depending on the number of people, and that we would have asymmetrical top cut, meaning that whoever had the same amount of match points as the person who was eighth seed would also have a chance to play for top cut. And we kind of saw it play out in the worst possible scenario this weekend. So for one, there was just under 2,000 people at this tournament, and the kicker to get to nine rounds of Swiss day one for some reason is 2,048 players. And yeah. so since we had just under 2000 players, there was only eight rounds of Swiss day one, which meant we ended day one of Swiss with three undefeated players. And I think right then when that happened, a lot of people were already thinking there's potentially going to be a problem tomorrow. And sure enough, as Swiss plays down, you know, anyone who has, a record of six and two or better makes it into day two. So anyone who has 18 match points, a six and two record, they're going to play four rounds of Swiss the next day. But there were several people who entered day two at six and two, went four and O, oh, won all four of their games in day two, didn't drop a game in the second day of the tournament, 
and then did not make top cut because the eighth seed was a final record of 10, one and one, meaning that if you were 10 and two, you were just outside of top cut. So if you entered and played in day two of the tournament at an X and two record, based on the way the tournament shaped up, you did not have a chance to make top cut. Now, part of the reason that this happened is because there were um, in round 11, there was a natural tie on the stream. I think that's part of why something happened. Yeah. Um, the natural tie. Let me see if I can open up the pairings. There it is. There was it's natural... kind of funny, like, Usually, like more ties ha- creates a higher chance for yeah. like people with lower match points to make cut. But in this situation, it would have caused like a down pair situation. Yeah. So there was a natural tie on the stream in this round. Also, Caleb lost to Gabe. I think if Caleb had beaten Gabe and he, he was 11 and 0, or if they had tied or something like yeah. that, it would have also made things a little different. And then in round 12, the top two tables were able to ID because they all paired into each other. We're all guaranteed cut with a ID and none of these 29 match point games ended in a tie with none of these four games ending in a tie. That meant that all eight of these players made it in and none of the others did. Yeah. Uh, None of these other 30 point players. Now there was a chance where if, if one of these four matches had tied, table 33 34 35 36 if any of these tables had tied then we would have had a 17 person top cut yeah so it was almost massive yeah but as it turns out it was a clean cut at 31 match points no one at x and two made it in yeah so like the to like talk to the negatives of this outcome the main one is if you made day two for how this tournament played out and it doesn't always play out this way. Also, I'll talk to the tie rate. The tie rate was maybe the lowest it's ever been at a major tournament. And like, a, it's like post COVID it was 10%. Um, the average, I think so. Someone told me the, someone said in my chat that the average for this season was a, Oh, maybe there's probably been like one or two more that maybe have had 10. Someone told me the average was like 11 this season so far. So we've maybe had one more at like 10%. Um, or maybe it's closer to like twelve average. We can look at all the we can look at all the tournaments so far this season. Yeah. Um, so if we look at we'll just look at the regionals. Yeah. Eleven percent in Joinville. All right. Uh, oh. Also, I learned that apparently I've been saying Joinville wrong. It's Joinville. Joinville. Say it. Something like that. Uh, apparently, the Lima standings don't work anymore. I saw. Uh, Julian right. tweet about that. Um, Dortmund, 13%. Mm-hmm. We've got Baltimore. Baltimore, which was 11%. And then Worlds, which was also in this format, was 8%. So that was the lowest. Holy moly. So I, I think we can probably exclude Worlds. So if we just look at like tournaments this season, it's around 11, right? As far as the also part of with worlds as well is what does this include people from day one? It does. Okay, never mind. Yeah. So I think we can. So I think we can like if we exclude worlds, that might be a little bit of an anomaly. We can say okay, the the tie rate was on average is eleven percent. This was on the lower side of that. We haven't had that many tournaments in this season in this format, so it was like ten percent, which is like the lower side of things. So if it had been eleven percent, there probably would have like eleven percent across the tournament. There probably would have been a X two player in cut. But just the way this one played out, there wasn't. And you could probably resim this day two multiple times and end up with multiple results that had a lot of people in top cut, right? Yeah, I can like look at the, I can run it on Limitless right here. And like the expected outcome is, well, it's like, uh, I assume this just means, yeah, 78% of the time there will, X2s will not make cut. So, um, so with that in mind, and this, uh, so this should only affect probably like my guess would be this. This outcome will only happen maybe in like ten percent of the major tournaments this season, where X twos do not make cut. Which means if you make day two in ten percent of the re- major terms this year, you will not make. You will not have a chance to make cut top cut uh, theoretically. Um, it only affects tournaments that are very close 
to the kicker for the next round, which this yep. one was. This tournament was very close to having nine rounds day one, but not quite there. And likewise, once we get to that nine round number, when we're close to the number of, I ran some simulators earlier on my stream, when we get to the close of five rounds day two, which is at 4,000 players, the same thing will happen where X2's all of a sudden will stop making cut. So it won't happen to that many tournaments throughout the season. Like I said, maybe 10%, but it still feels pretty bad. Like Dortmund was pretty close in terms of player size, but we had an X2 and cut in, in Dortmund. Um, so it, it won't affect a ton of tournaments throughout the season, but it still feels pretty bad that the potential exists to make day two and not even be able to make top cut. And past that for me personally, it also just feels like that margin for error of just two wins, like, like, uh, of only going to be able to take two. Once you take two losses, you're potentially out of the tournament feels like too much to me. Like, I feel like that is like the max it should be is at two losses. Like anything more than two losses feels like having to do more, having to do better than two losses to progress to top cut feels too much for the game of the Pokemon TCG. Um, which is like, I saw something a lot of people bring it up in like response to people being like, I don't know, X2 not making cut kind of feels bad. People were like, well, don't you want the game to be harder and the best players proceeding? But like, there is like a breaking point where it's like, I don't know if we only need the people who go undefeated in a tournament to advance in a tournament, right? Um, besides like the actual potential like winner, right? If they go undefeated into top cut and continue undefeated, sure. But yeah, I don't know if we need to only take, at the end of day two Swiss, we're not only looking for like the two people who are 12 and 0 to play against each other, right? I think it's fine to include more people due to the variance of the tournament. That's why there is so many Swiss rounds and we don't just play until there's one undefeated person. And that's why there is top cut as well past that. It's not just, oh, well, now we have one undefeated person who's 12 and 0. Let's end the tournament here. They're the winner. It's like, because of the variance in the tournament and also like top cut is just kind of hype and the, the process around that it like ending after Swiss would be pretty unsatisfying. So we do have like these um, systems in place to try and end up with what would be, we think which, which would give us like the potential best player or um, best player plus best deck combination winning the tournament overall. Right. So we do want some combination of these kind of like safety nets to try and push that forward. Right. We're not just playing until one person is undefeated in the tournament. And then we just like, the tournament ends right otherwise that's what we would do so yeah. it just feels bad and the biggest thing on top of that like i'm sure and we had some there was a lot of players right you see we could have had a 17 person top cut if x2s were in cut so there was a lot of players eight nine players who just did not play into cut who who won yeah. all their some of them went from 6-2 yep. to 10-2 and did not make cut and that was players like alex shamansky and nathan ginsburg both of them went into day two at six and two went four and zero, oh, and then they didn't even get top 16 that yeah, feels pretty bad. But that's one of the uh, products of the new system where resistance carries over from day one to day two as yeah. well. So since you were six and two, you're going to finish lower than people like Ryan Antonucci and Xander Perot, just two people offhand who I know for a fact went into day two at seven and one, right? Yeah, that one round difference is going to matter that much more. Yeah. Um, but it does feel like just kind of basing it on we could just base it on Matt. And I've seen like a bunch of people mention like a couple of th like things to like why how to fix this. And a lot of people are talking about like adding a round to day one or adding a round to day two. I think like the easiest fix is just to say if you go X and two, you make cut. And this is only going to affect like 10 percent of tournaments, like I said, maybe even less where this is going to be a situation where X and twos aren't making cut for like 90 percent of tournaments after running some simulations like 90 percent of tournaments. X two should probably be making cut. Um at like 90% of the tournaments, but like, it feels like for those other 10%, why don't we just like do the same thing and just yeah. say, if you go X and two, you make top cut. We can just add that to the structure, the tournament structure that we have right now. Just add that on top. We don't have to play more rounds day one. We don't have to play another round day two. It could lead to effectively another round day two, I guess, because it would extend us to top 16 or top 32. But then it like just kind of makes all of the structures basically the same. The biggest thing for me that I liked about the asymmetrical cut it's because it, it felt like you always had a goal to play for, right? Day one to day two, you have to go at least X and two. And then mm -hmm. it felt like to make top cut, well, if you go X and two, you'll make top cut. But now we see that's not always going to be the reality. But I don't see a reason why we can't just make that the reality. Because for 90% of the tournaments, it's going to be the reality. Let's just make it for 100%. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely plenty of things they could do to fix it. Um, I think I agree. Like, the easiest thing would just be to say, like, Treat the tournament as stages, right? To get from stage one to stage two, you need 18 match points. To get to stage two to stage three, you need 30 match points, right? Yep. 
in the 12, 12 round one. Yeah. in in, yeah, for whenever there's less than 2048 players, um, the other things could just be to always, yeah, I think like the 2048 player, uh, kicker is maybe a little too high. Like, why is it 2048? Why isn't it like 1500 or 1200 or a thousand even to get to, to nine rounds? Because the old kicker to get nine rounds of Swiss was like 200 something. <laughs> like, well, I assume the reason is, is because we're following true Swiss system, which those numbers probably come from the true Swiss system. Sure. Which, which is fine. Like I said, like we can even follow the true Swiss system except just make it that X2 always makes cut. That's what I'm saying. It's like the simplest change. Well, and then another that. thing, something else, like a true Swiss system, I don't think accounts for ties. Uh, Yeah, it might not. That's and true. And that's, that's what I was going to say with... You could remove ties. And then yeah. you would have X2s always making cut, but the thing would be there would be a lot of them. There would be more, yeah. We would have... I just ran a limitless calculator... How many people do you think would be in top cut? A zero percent tie rate, no intentional draws, tournament with two thousand players. This current system, eight rounds day one, four rounds day two. How many people in cut? Thirty five. Thirty eight. Mm, that was close. Thirty eight and a half. And our current Swiss system would exclude six people because we are playing a max of thirty two cut, asymmetrical cut. It does cut off at thirty two, yep. so they would not do a top sixty four asymmetrical cut in that situation. So there is like a problem there, I guess, as well, where it's like. Then all of a sudden, should we be playing out top 64? I don't know. That's like that becomes like another question. It feels kind of bad for those six players just based on resistance, especially when it includes like day one resistance to all of a sudden not yeah. be in cut alongside other players. Also making it 18 match points or sorry, 30 match points to make it to single LM or 33 match points whenever we have one extra round would yeah. also increase the tie rate because people would be if they don't have a loss on their record, more incentivized to tie or like well, more incentivized to be okay with a tie result. Uh, well, to, yeah, to, you can like, so you basically, what I, the conclusion I've come to is cause I ran some simulations like for Lil this weekend, it's probably incorrect to tie. Um, so, cause it has to be close to the threshold of that next round bump for it to make a difference. Right. So like going into Lil this weekend, you probably still want to make gentlemen's agreements as soon as round one, that's like optimal. But like tournaments like Louisville or Dortmund was even questionable as well. Taking that first tie is probably fine. So you almost need to like run a Swiss calculator on Limitless once you know the number of players in the tournament with just like a 10 or 11% tie rate. Probably check both of them and see what uh, the chance for uh, X2 making cut is. And then from there, determine whether or not you're okay with taking that first tie or and then making gentlemen's agreements immediately after that, which is like another negative part of the system is now we're adding like another layer to the gentlemen's agreement situation that already feels really bad, right? It already feels really bad to sit down round one and be like, hey, do you want to make a gentleman's agreement before you even play your first game of Pokemon in the tournament? Because that is optimal. And if you're trying to be competitive, it is optimal to make that gentleman's agreement when you're going into something like Lil this weekend. But now all of a sudden you walk into like a Louisville size tournament, you run the Swiss calculator and you're like, well, I guess I should take that first tie and then, you know, you play through the tournament. Maybe you don't tie at all, but if you do, you get that first tie. And then immediately after the tie, you have to be thinking, okay, now the gentlemen's agreements have to come in for me. And I have to make gentlemen's agreements every round after this. So that just feels like a very unfortunate burden to put on players who are trying to be more competitive in the game. I feel like the most competitive players in the game, they probably don't feel the same way about it and they kind of just do it. And it's like not that big of a deal for them. But I feel like newer players getting into the game, it's like a really negative experience. Um, if they're trying to be competitive and they understand that making these gentlemen's agreements is optimal and they're trying to like compete with the best in the world and they want to like, you know, they want to be able to uh, get there. They know that this is a step that they have to take. I really, the more that this season has gone on so far, I have really become for just removing ties. Me too. I think I'm I'm like definitely pro. So like don't put it on the players to sit down and like have to decide that this is what the optimal thing is to do in this tournament structure is I have to make this gentleman's agreement round to round and then deal with the fact that my opponent may not honor said gentleman's agreement, right? Yeah, I think the the best way to do it to kind of preserve stall and control is if if a if a match ends in game 2, the winner of game 1 is the winner and if you're in game 3, it's decided by prize cards. Like I think that's the best way to uh, to handle just removing ties and i agree i think if we're gonna keep up this true swiss system the amount of pressure it puts what happens on players for the gentlemen's we should just remove yeah. ties overall 
I think it's like a negative player experience. Like in the past, I don't think any of this stuff was that bad in terms yeah. of player experience. But this is like now being like, like I said, if you want to be like competitive, it's like forced upon you. So here's what some of the player reaction has been to this happening. I mean, you yourself tweeted, I don't think I'll be attending any events if X2 isn't guaranteed to make cut. It got me thinking, so I went and checked some numbers. I think LAIC, X2 will, will be on, it'll be on the edge whether or not X2 will make cut at LAIC. There's currently 23 people registered. 2300. Uh, 2300 23 people would be crazy <laughs> everyone go now <laughs> that's free <laughs> free top 32 um but yeah let's say 150 juniors 150 seniors that's 2000 masters gonna be a couple mm. no shows we're in that 1900 yep. range um that's in the does x2 make it that's that's the run a swiss calculator on limitless see what that spits out and then probably decide from there uh and even sacramento is at 2141 that'll probably be safe that'll probably come in Closer to like Dortmund numbers, which means it'll be safe. Yeah, 1700, but, 1800. But LAIC, it might be one that's up in the air on the coming up. But like I said, Lil should be a tournament where you are not, you don't want to tie. A tie is effectively a loss. So you want to play for those gentlemen. Alex Shermansky tweeted, I went 4 0 in day two. I will not make asymmetrical cuts. <laughs> if this is not evidence of a complete failure of the system, I don't know what is. I just really hope they change this ASAP because why did I even play in day two? I couldn't make cut. Yeah, and someone could make the argument, well, you still got top 32, Alex. It's like, Alex is a player, I'm sure he doesn't mind getting top 32, but he's like, he's, you know, IC champion. He's playing for dubs out here. I'm sure that's on his mind more so than anything. And I think you can cater to both players in that sense. Like, if your goal is to just, you, if you make day two and you're playing for top 32, that's fine. But also, like, giving the the players the avenue to actually win the tournament if you show up for day two is probably also correct, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's interesting because it's like this was a possibility to happen, but like what if any of those matches end in a tie, right? And then we have 17 people. Is it even a discussion point this week, you know? It might not be, but it's a. It, I don't want to say it's a good thing that it happened, but it probably would have happened eventually and we'd be talking about it. So probably sooner, better sooner than later, right? There's a higher chance that actually a, a change will get made this early in the season. And it might have still been a discussion point, but I think it probably would have been brushed off more easily. Like, yeah, that would be ridiculous if that did happen. It's a good thing it didn't happen, right? But the fact that it did happen means we are talking about it. And I think it probably would have happened at some point throughout the season. So it's better sooner than later. Um, kind of feels bad for the players who got hit, had to get hit by it for us to have this big discussion about it. But someone had to, like, take that L for us to hopefully see things get changed. And like I said, it's not going to affect that many tournaments. It shouldn't. Um, and there's an easy fix. All you have to do is say X2. It's asymmetrical cut is just X2 based. Um, and then we're good to go. We can just progress from there. We don't have to add more rounds. If Pokemon is trying to keep it at that 9 4, 8 4 to 9 4, you know, to like help with uh, like, I don't know, I keep the term moving along in terms of like the, the tournament uh, schedule and everything. That's fine. We can keep it at that round number. Just, you know, make it so that X, X2 makes cut. And then we had Mr. Doom and Gloom himself, Jake Gearhart, tweeted, I decided to take an indefinite break from official Pokemon TCG tournaments. Baffling card design from creatures combined with horrible tournament structure changes and policy decisions by TPCI have ended what was the best time to play the game in over half a decade. Yeah. Finally, it was too much for Jake. <laughs> this <laughs> It's like, I feel like someone can put up with a bad format for the tournament, but good, you know, having fun playing the game. Uh, someone can put up with not having fun playing the game, but the tournament format is good, right? But the yeah. combination of the two just is too, it's too much. Yeah, Pheasant Skibbity plus Dusnor into X2 not making cut. Too overwhelming for Gearheart, but I hope he does make a return um, when things uh, get a little bit better. I personally don't, do, like dislike this current state of the game myself but i definitely understand how dustinor can be a little bit unenjoyable especially depending on like the Jake, style of deck i think the card he dislikes more is pheasantipity yeah yeah i think it is pheasantipity is the one that he hates the most and everything he says about the card is correct like it's a lot harder to make comebacks since that card has been um printed since we've had it in the format right yeah. Um, Iono is not what it once was, and it did feel pretty good for a, for a long time as like that potential comeback card that you could very heavily play around. Mm, Dippity, um, well, it's doing what the card is supposed to do, I guess. Well, maybe it's not what they wanted the card to do, but it is doing something. Yeah. 
I think it's probably better than they wanted it to be, right? They probably saw, like, I mean, they probably compared it similarly to Oricorio GX, which was a card that was played somewhat in some decks, but it Not wasn't super much. heavily played. Yeah. Um, but now it's like, this is a card that's in almost every single deck. Yeah. The biggest thing is, like, it doesn't feel like a liability when you put it in play. You're like, oh, yeah, I got my Pheasantipity on my bench. That's so sick. Like, even back with Oricorio, you're like, okay. But I don't even but know I if if it had 150 HP. I don't know if it would matter. Yeah, because <laughs> Squawkabilly has 160 HP and everyone's putting that guy in play. Yeah, but that feels like a little bit more of a liability when you do put that in play. You know, if you draw slow, all of a sudden Charizard can get two prize cards before you draw prize cards, stuff like that. Um, people are making jokes in my chat. Give it give it 60 HP. And I was like, you say that now, but when I buddy buddy Poffin for my Pheasantipity, <laughs> you're going to be... <laughs> 80 HP, 80 HP. 80 80, HP. Yeah, that's, that's what we decided on. 80 HP is the perfect number for Pheasantipity. <laughs> yeah, buddy buddy Poffin for it. But still can be ba basically KO'd by everything. Dust Snork can KO it. That's what we're looking for here. I don't know. Dust Snork KO your Fezendipity. <laughs> the one other thing I want to say about this before we talk about the actual results of the tournament is like there is precedent for Pokemon to change the tournament structure midseason. They did this for VG uh, in 2022, I think it was. Yeah. And like I think I, it makes so much sense for them to change it because it's only going to affect a small percentage of tournaments. It's like, like I said, it's going to be five to 10% of tournaments will probably run into this issue throughout the season. It's a small percent of tournaments, which maybe you could make the reverse argument. Well, then why do you need to make the change? It's for like the, um, it's so unfulfilling for players to go to a tournament and then make day two at X and two and just know you can't make top. Like it's a very unfulfilling system, right? It's a very unenjoyable system to play in. So it makes sense for them to just make the change and say X twos will make cut, uh, like it's somehow word that into the asymmetrical cut thing. Like everything is the same way it is. Just add in the clause. X two also makes cut, right? Like X, X, top cut extends down to the first player who has X and two, like to the last player who has X and two, uh, maximum of top th of thirty two players, right? That's all you need to do. All you need to do is that. We're good to go. It just makes so much sense for them to make this change because it's going to affect a very small percentage of tournaments. Most of the tournaments X two is going to make cut anyways, and it's not going to even affect those. But the one, the outliers. We just make them a more enjoyable experience for everyone. So, like, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if they don't make the change. But it's like, this is such a dub for TPCI to take and just be like, oh, let's just add this change. It's so, like a, such a free dub for them to, I don't know, I guess score brownie points with the community. Like, yeah, like I'd be it's just I, if sad you, if they don't do it. If you're listening to this and you dislike the current tournament format and you would like to see it changed, I think the best way to encourage Pokemon or to like make them aware uh, overwhelmingly that there are a lot of people that have a similar belief that there, there's something wrong here would be to submit a support ticket. So if you are interested in seeing the tournament structure change, I would encourage you to submit a support ticket at support.pokemon.com. Write out your thoughts. Tell them why you dislike it. Tell them what you would like to see and send it in. That simple. I might submit my... No, I think I've submitted a support ticket in the past for something else. I might submit, submit my second support ticket ever. It's coming up here. You should. Really yeah. something that would be good to do would, if if this is like something we really want the community to get behind would be for someone like yourself with like that's a figure in the community to like tweet out a copy-paste uh, you know, send this support ticket to Pokemon. Something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. I should do that. I should have someone else type it up because my... uh. <laughs> my, what? Someone else, I need someone else to type it up for me because my uh, I don't know my typing up of stuff like that is not great <laughs> actually it's funny that you said that though my t I need someone else to type it up for me because my typing up of stuff is not that good <laughs> um, I have to get chat GBT involved on this one okay there you go um, no uh, it's just funny that you mentioned that though because like the, the word that came to mind before you fully finish your sentence was petition and apparently there was some kid <laughs> At Louisville, yeah, who I was walking around with a petition to get Dustnor banned, <laughs> and that's just so funny to me. Just walking around with a clipboard trying to get signatures to get Dustnor banned. Well, it was like a big, um, it was like a poster board. It was like a sign that he was holding oh, up was and it? walking around, and, and people were people signing it? it on the back. That's hilarious. I would have definitely signed that thing. I don't really care about Dustnor one way or another, but I would have signed it. Super, uh, super cute story. Picture of it, but... Yeah, Chip, you type it up. I'll tweet it out. Well, I'm um, not going to be involved in any of this, but... All right, uh, I'll get someone else to type it up. <laughs> I'll tweet it out. 
and then uh yeah we'll, we'll just sum, submit some support tickets because yeah it's like such an easy change to make like it's yeah and, and it's not saying like i don't even think like tbc has too much at fault here because it's probably like a unforeseen problem yeah sure on their end as well they probably didn't even think about it i don't think anyone in the community thought about it i didn't see anyone else like make a post about it ever about like the potential of this happening but now that it's happened it's like yeah it feels pretty bad it seems incorrect let's just uh let's go ahead and let's fix this all right well let's move on and talk about the results from louisville um so let's start off by looking at the meta share so day one meta we saw raging bolt 14 percent down a little bit from where it's been but still the most popular deck by a decent margin three and a half percent more popular than tarapagos dusknor the second most popular deck then we did have dragapult ex just under 10 percent nine and a half we got lugia at 8.6 percent our uh, reggie drago v star at eight percent and then origin form dusk uh, origin form palkia v star dusknor at 7.75 percent day one yeah, so I think the uh, big changes, but maybe not like not super unpredictable, was uh, Dragapult kind of stuck around, and Trapagos big boost. Yep, Charizard's gone though. Charizard off gone. the top six, and Palkia replaced it. It feels like right, which is I would I would thought Palkia would definitely be more popular, but seven percent was actually kind of a surprise. Basically eight percent there. I think so. Yeah, this is it's like the type of deck I wouldn't expect to ever be this popular, but. Um, but like, I totally would have thought it to be like a 5% deck. Right. Yeah. But I think it was a really good play, but yeah, but the, how popular it was is definitely a big surprise. And then as we move into day two, we do see raging bolt retains its number one spot going up to almost 15% Terrapagos in second place at 11.86. So both of those converting positively, also converting positively Reggie Drago converting positively as Lugia converting positively is Charizard and then Palkia at 7.22 falling off just a little bit on conversion rate but kind of negligible so basically it's like the exact same and what you'd expect the best decks improved a little bit is generally what you expect it feels like dragapult like, fell off super hard yeah is charizard just replaced dragapult basically um because even if you look at these percentages it's like besides palkia it's like eight to ten it's like the difference is like two percent difference not a huge margin of difference it feels like yeah um between like Drago and Tropicos in day one and then day two, it's about the same, right? All of the deck, but yeah, but yeah, Dragapult has left the building and replaced by the Charizard there, um, who had its come up going into day two after falling pretty far, to be honest, from where it was. Cause it was like, what? It wasn't like, weren't they both like 15% going into Baltimore or something? Or at Dortmund? Dortmund, we had Charizard at 17%. Jeez, man. That's yeah, quite fell the fall real off. hard. Um, but yeah, Charizard definitely is not as good of a play as it. I mean, Charizard hasn't been like that ridiculously good of a play for a little while. It's like been a fine play. And uh, even last week on the podcast, me and you were both like, it doesn't feel super, super good right now. Um, but it did show up. Like, even though it had that lower percentage day one, it did show up going into day two. Yeah, and it did end up doing it. pretty decently. There's a few in top 32, including one uh, in the top four. We'll talk about that shortly. We will start though with the deck that did win the event and that is raging bolt shout outs to our friend caleb getimer for his fourth regional win yeah did it with the the bolt um uh grant mainly the props on the list and the big card <clears throat> for sure in raging bolt and it's not just in and i'm sure that's reflected in another list that we can probably mention here is the bravery charms right Three Bravery Charm in the build, which is super, super powerful at just, like, denying two hit KOs from your opponent. Terrapagos can't KO your Ogre Pawn if it has a Bravery Charm. Ursaluna can't KO your Raging Bolt if it has a Bravery Charm. Uh, Shinchino needs an extra energy to KO a Raging Bolt. Lugia can't KO Ogre Pawns if they have Bravery Charms. Yep. There's so many ways to deny these two prize knockouts from your opponent with the Bravery Charms in the current meta. It definitely is, like, the, I feel like the key to the Raging Bolt in the current meta right now was the Bravery Charms. Yeah. Some other kind of uh, standout cards, I would say, in this list. Uh, the Luminion V and a pair of Ultra Ball. It's something you don't really see in Raging Bolt decks too often. The Slither Wing is a one prize option. It's pretty decent in the meta. It KOs Ursaluna, it KOs Terrapagos, uh, it KOs Mimikyu, which I think is the main reason that they wanted to play it. Um, and then also the Iron Bundle we've seen pop up every once in a while. But there's also no Iono and no Trekking Shoes in this list. Briar as well. <clears throat> in uh in this one 
Yeah. Yeah, and I think uh what was Grant calling it? Uh barefoot barefoot bolt. Barefoot bolt, yeah. No trekking no, shoes. No trekking shoes. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a super straightforward list, right? It's just trying to get ahead, stay ahead. Like you mentioned, no Iono and no Briar, which also can be like considered like some kind of like a comeback card. Um, although I think Briar just has use cases in the Charizard matchup without any purpose of really coming back, but even just having a chance. Um, but besides that matchup, Briar's not very good besides the Charizard matchup. I saw Grant's tweet. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can find it real quick. He, someone asked him something about the trekking shoes. Yeah, it was like, uh, did this feel more consistent at a turn to attack with Lumineon and Ultra Balls even after cutting shoes? And he said, didn't cut shoes because they were never there to begin with. It's like the classic Grant Manley. He didn't <laughs> he didn't look at uh anyone else's Raging Bolt deck list. He just built Raging Bolts the way he I never had I never had trekking shoes yeah. in my in my bolt list. Yeah, I mean that's about as simple as it gets. And I think mm -hmm. moving forward, that's gonna be like a big Big thing that Raging Ball players are probably going to switch up is Bravery Charms. Because if you look at, we can go look, jump to the 10th place list from Xander Perot. Yep. Uh, which also had Bravery Charms. Four of them did have trekking shoes. So no barefoot bolt here. Um, but a pretty straightforward list overall still. But yeah, had four Bravery Charms. One up <laughs> on what Caleb had. Yeah. I did see, I think, in Xander's tweet that he said that the Briar was pretty much useless um yeah. i do think the iono is honestly pretty decent and i think caleb did say that there was several times where he thought like an iono would be kind of nice just like have some option to like disrupt come back something like that right yeah and like knowing your opponent doesn't have iono is almost like the bigger thing like as yeah. soon as like um i don't know how much it mattered in like the finals matchup but i can only imagine how nice it must feel as lost box and knowing because i'm sure <laughs> yeah. davidson knew at that point that caleb did not have iono I can only imagine at that point playing Lost Box and being like, my opponent doesn't play hand disruption. This is free. <laughs> like, yeah. and that matchup for the if, speaking of the finals, like we we should if we ran that finals back ten times, I think Michael Davidson wins nine of them. Like the matchup is so good for Lost Box. I don't know. The Bravery Charms definitely make things a little bit annoying. Like it's got it, two it, lost vacuum, bro. Yeah, I know, but it can things can get out of range pretty quickly, which is what we kind of saw in Game Three. Like yeah. Davidson kind of slipped for a turn and then all of a sudden Caleb, well, I Davidson think Davidson did make the mistake of taking the knockouts yeah. with the Greninja play. Um, that I think play was, was pretty my, bad, I think. Yeah. If he's going to take the knockout, I think he said he should have done it with Cram. But yeah. maybe you also could have just like not, you could have also just like punched Pheasant Dippity or something just kind of ignored for a turn as well. But yeah, the Cram, think, the Cram KO probably would have been decent. I think, yeah, he attacked with Greninja. Attacking with Cram definitely would have been better. And I think passing with Comfey would have in the active spot would have been better than taking the knockout to be honest because then Caleb yeah. has to knock himself out to attack because the yeah, <laughs> the only thing had just attacked the only thing you risk is like bravery charm switch card which Caleb did have Caleb did sure, have sure. Bravery charm switch card to like then all of a sudden get out of range of knocking yourself out again but then vacuum could get involved yeah maybe Ursaluna just takes over from there anyway so never uh, know never know yeah definitely I would say definitely favored though for lost box for sure Especially yeah. with the lack of hand disruption, like that only adds to the uh, the matchup being that much more potentially one yeah. side. I guess also lack of Briar as well, because Briar's a card that could come up in that matchup to close it out, depending on the situation. Yeah, for Caleb. And speaking of Davidson, I think this was probably the biggest surprise of Top Cut was the reemergence of Lost Box, which totally makes sense, right? Uh, the biggest reason for Lost Box to fall off was because it has just an abysmal matchup into Reggie Drago V-Star, which was the best deck for quite some time and, and the most popular deck. Um, you just cannot do anything about it, really. And yeah. uh, Davidson did not play against a single Reggie Drago and took it all that. the way to the to the finals. Yeah, and it wasn't that like, like it was only eight percent of the meta, right? Like that's like a fine. It's fine to take an auto loss, and Drago's not like you don't like expect like three or four Drago in top cut when you hopefully get there yourself, right? It's like it's like Drago's like another good deck in the format. We did see one Drago uh, make its way to cut um, as well, get into the top eight, but like it's like a very reasonable auto loss to take. I think. Yeah. Um, I think, and on top of that, other teammates say, that played the deck like Caleb Rogerson. He played against two Drago, and Hedrick oh. did not make day two. Wait, Drago did he? 
he hit two Drago as well. Yeah, it's going to be rough. And uh, who else played? Uh, Ginsburg. I don't know what Ginsburg lost to. Oh. Other Ginsburg. There we are. Did not lose to Drago, but he, he also only Drago. lost. He also did only lose two games. <laughs> yeah, but then didn't make cut. And then didn't make cut. It didn't even make top <laughs> 16. Anyway. <laughs> But yeah, very um, cool deck. Uh, props to those guys on coming up with a good list. I think, yeah. did I say on the podcast? I don't remember if I said it on the podcast or um, somewhere else, but I I did feel like going in that there was a chance like a Lost Box deck could pop up. Yeah. Another thing, big thing for that as well, no one played Manaphy, right? So you're like Dragapult and Charizard matchups, which usually can be tough because once they establish Charizards, they are like so far in the prize trade. Or stuff like that that you it's harder you free to come back but like the two prize turn just even if you don't care if they have bench three charmanders but you still get to ko2 with your greninja right or take away their pidgey so they don't have a pidgey out the rest of the game um that's like big for the prize trade moving forward or ko both their charmanders now they just don't get to attack with charizard next turn no one's playing manaphy right now in any of these decks so yeah i think this was a really good meta call i don't know how good lost box is moving forward though but yeah like this is like the when you can find these gaps in the meta to take advantage of, like we saw here from Davidson. Like those are like the the big moments where it's like almost like free, not free dub city on the table, but like so much free potential city on the table if you can yeah. find that gap in the meta. Huge opportunity, huge opportunity. Yeah, we did see a Palkia in top eight. There was a few more in the top uh, thirty two as well. This deck performed very very well at the tournament and it was kyle lesnowitz taking it the furthest though to a third place finish yeah everyone's list is pretty similar yeah we saw kyle here i guess like the big thing that stands out is brought back the rotom grafton had rotom yeah. in baltimore in dortmund stefan did not have rotom kyle bringing the rotom back only keeping around one trekking shoe so not completely barefoot with this deck but you don't want to be completely barefoot just a little barefoot um, so it still has the one shoe sticking around. And yeah, this deck is like super good right now. I think it's going to struggle a little bit moving forward with bravery, so much Bravery Charm in Bolts probably. But because um, that matchup was like a fine matchup, it definitely gets a little bit harder. if They have that much extra HP. So definitely play the Lost Vacuum, which is something Ian did not have going up against Xander in that last round of day one. Yeah, we saw Sebastian Lashmet with the Charizard getting a top four finish. Yeah, this coming one. off a top eight finish at NAIC for Sebastian. He also got second at Worlds and Seniors, I think, back in 2022. So he's a pretty young player. That was a thing that stood out to me massively about this top cut. I mean, I think David, Davidson is like 17, 18. Uh, Sebastian has got to be less than 18. Um, Benjamin Herbert is a first-year master. Like, these young kids, man, are so good at the game. It's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of not fair. <laughs> Why do you think I retired? I mean, so <laughs> if you really want to see like the potential of the Charizard deck, you should go watch Sebastian's top four match. Also, like all like the sequencing and game plan that went into that. So if you're trying to learn about the Charizard deck a little bit more, go watch uh, Sebastian versus Benjamin in or top eight, top eight match. Because um, like that really showed like the power of Charizard, its potential, like with this, the Thor in the Dust Nor, all these things combined, like what the deck can actually do. I was actually opposed to that matchup being the one we streamed for top eight, but I kind of came up after the decision had already been made mm -hmm. uh, because I felt like it was the hardest. It was the most favored matchup for one side. side. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it was, I, I thought the Drago was going to beat the Charizard and it turns out the opposite happened. Right. It's yeah. just, you, you just never know what anything can happen. Right. In a Pokemon game, like where there's two really good players and, yeah, um, and, and all been, the, the other the other three top eight games did all go to, to game threes. Yeah, that would have been my guess as well. Oh, I forget what the other ones were. Well, there was like Lost Box up against Lugia. Yeah, so we had uh, Raging Bolt versus Lugia. We had uh, Palkia versus Terrapagos. Uh, then Lost Box versus Lugia. Honestly, the Palkia versus Terrapagos would have been cool because Gabe, Gabe also had the Manaphy, I believe. So that would have actually been an interesting more interesting match because of the Manaphy inclusion. Because without Manaphy, I feel like... Yeah. Palkia, if Palkia goes first, the, the set almost feels like it's over. Because like, like, it's harder for Terrapagos to to capitalize if they go first on like a really, really powerful turn two and like completely take over the game. 
Where it's like a little bit easier for, for Palkia to like just win the game. If they go first in game one, they're going to draw three prize cards or two prize cards turn two, take away all of your important Pokemon, and they'll do it again in game three if they lose game two. But because of the Manaphy, definitely has a little bit more back and forth to be played. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we do see the Terrapagos here from Gabe in top eight. Nothing, I think, super standout from this list. Yeah. The Manaphy is probably the main thing. He does play Colrus. He does play Vitality Band, cards you don't always see. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's very close to... I just kind of like use Giovanni's list as the baseline. And it's yeah. like two cards off Giovanni's, like minus Iano for Colrus and then minus something for Manaphy. Um, but that's what I... Oh, no Thorn. There's no Thorn in here. Thorn's gone as well. Dude, I don't yeah. know. The Thorn feels so... Every time I play the... Like, whenever I play Giovanni's list with the Thorn, the Thorn felt like the best card. Gabe did lose game three to prizing double fan Rotom. Mm. Thorn's not going to save you there. Yeah, couldn't set up. Shout out to Grant Manley's third fan Rotom that people were uh, <laughs> <laughs> Or Joe Bernard and Alex Dow's fourth fan Rotom. All right, well, that's a little bit too far. Now, that's a little bit too far. <laughs> Let's take a look at Benjamin Herbert's top eight. Uh, Reggie Drago. There is the one more Noctowl. The owls are here, man. The owls are here. I do be hating on the owl pretty often. I will say, for anyone who's heard me hate on the owl, I have not actually played with the owl. Um, so the hate may be unjustified. Might be unjustified. But until I actually play with it, I'm going to keep hating. Yeah, um, it's funnier to hate. I am a big Drago fan in general, though. Uh, yeah, it's definitely way funnier to hate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big Drago fan in general, for sure, though. What you said cool to, to John Ng, I was laughing so hard. <laughs> John shared his list and said, horrendous day two performance from a 7-1 start. Opponents flipped heads, and I bricked too much. Season off to an awful start. And John Ng did play a 2-2 knock towel this time. <laughs> Azul ratioed him and said, it's okay. I'm sure going up to a 3-3 knock towel line will fix it. That's the improvement moving forward. That's what he needs, bro. John's coming back big time at LAIC. I don't know if he's going to any of the European events, but he'll have a 3-3 knock towel in his Drago at LAIC and win the thing. For sure. Guaranteed. We just need more. And we do have a pair of Lugias here to round out the top eight. Kieran Farah with the 2 2 Chinchino. And then we've got Yerko with um, the Arvin Vitality Band package. Also the Wellspring Mask Ogre Pond, which he played in Lima. Or and Raikou as well. Raikou, Raikou, Raikou right. no basic lightning, just like another one KO option. Good for the Palkia matchup. Yeah. Um, and actually, like, I mean, I still think, I, yeah, people. I don't know if I want to say people aren't respecting Lugia, but like, like it's it's just gonna it's like the most successful deck this season, I think, pretty much overall. Um, and I think it'll still continue to do that until like people actually step up and like I don't know if you can tech for it though. I don't know. Lugia just seems like the best deck. It just is the best deck. Most successful deck. Uh, oh, hang on. Let's do Masters. Okay. Yep. It is Lugia. It is Lugia. Not by a whole ton. Raging Bolt's a, a little bit uh, is close. but By be, yeah. earnings, by points, by top eight finishes, and tie. Not oh, by no. dubs. Not by dubs, because that's Raging Bolt, baby. Well, hold on. One of those was the Champions League. That's best of one. Anything, I'd like, you know, it's a roulette. It's matchup roulette at that point in best <laughs> of one. True matchup roulette when it becomes best of one. So we can't count. No, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, I think Lugia is just, like, literally the best deck right now. But, like... We have Sino, we have Enhanced Stammer. You can go out of your way to give yourself a better matchup against this. I don't think you can completely, like, there's no, like, Maridon and Thorns will never be popular enough to, like, completely hate Lugi out of the format, but it can get hostile enough for it where it's like, do you really want to walk into every matchup where everyone has an Enhanced Stammer to Sino? Probably not. But until that happens, I think Lugi is going to be the number one deck to keep placing in top eights. Like, it'll always be there in top eight. The question is just how many. Um, and then, yeah, as we go down through the top 32 and stuff, there's what could have been a sick top, a <sighs> sick top 16, man. That would have been so cool. It would have been really annoying if it was 17 people, though, to be honest. Well, you just don't stream that match. That that has to be like the off. No, off you match. have to stream it because you can't advance the tournament, right? Oh, no, no. You, you, no, you can. Mind, yeah. Right, right now. Yeah. They would just go to the other side. Of the, you would like maybe do two top 16 matches or something like that. But Ooh, yeah, um, we had it baked into the schedule as an optional thing like if it happens like there was yeah. it's baked into the schedule that there's a chance a top 32 would happen yeah the variety of decks wouldn't have expanded too much we would have just got some storm axes in there right that's all that would have added to like more decks i think yeah. everything else was already represented in top cut but that would have like changed the dynamic of the top cut getting some stalls in there i don't know could have been cool 
really, really cool to see like that top 16 play out. But unfortunately, one of those matches just couldn't tie. Why couldn't you guys just tie, bro? Just take one, take an L for the team. Give us the top 16. <laughs> um, uh, but the, I guess like another thing to mention besides Lost Box, there wasn't like a bunch of like crazy decks that really stood out. Like you look at like Dortmund, we had like the the dra Dragapult and the Golden Go from Yella. But this one, it's like. Lost yeah. Box is back, but we've seen it before. There's and... no surprises here, really, except the Lost Box. Yeah, it feels like the meta maybe has standardized a little bit. How many more mysteries are out there? We don't have that many more tournaments in this format. We got two more in Europe and then LAIC. We're not coming back to um, Latin America or US and Canada regions for a major until LAIC, I guess, the big one at the end. Which is the two European majors coming up. We'll see what the players over there, see if they've been cooking. What they've been cooking. Henry Chow, now Gardevoir's strongest soldier. Yep. The highest finishing Gardevoir at 36th place. With the turbo build again. But I think it just has to be the way you play it. Like, I think to yeah. keep up with what's going on. And the highest finishing Golden Go, we've got a 55th place finish from Matthew. Mm hmm. Oh, I guess we could give uh, a shout out to Piper with the, the Bennett mm -hmm. Gardevoir. True. Usually it's just the. Was it the Polish players, right? That are yeah, the rocking it, but it's made its way overseas. Um, I'm sure players have played it and made day two at uh, other American Canadian events. Uh, Dude, but she was she was close she, to getting cut. She had a crazy game against Sebastian in Swiss. Like the game was crazy in uh, I guess round ten was it that they played? No, maybe it was eleven. Um where she went down in game three like one to six prizes and mounted this huge improbable comeback and it, it she needed like so many turns to win the game and almost got there but then sebastian like at the very end had the pieces i think it was like rare candy dusk nor to like take a one prize ko mm -hmm. off a bench or something like that all right chip you got to chill with whatever you're clinking around over there I'm Sorry. saving <laughs> I'm saving the listeners here on this one. My bad, my bad, my bad. Um the I do wanna like me. I do just want to kind of like shout out this deck in general. I think I don't want to call it underrated because I feel like a lot of people just don't rate the deck. I think it's really good right now. I think it's just really, really good. Especially because you have a really good raging bolt matchup. So if anyone's looking for like a new deck to pick up that is good and they just want to play something different, look no further than Bennett Guard for it's a really interesting um like more complex deck in terms of like learning the strategies for the certain matchups but like that's one of the things i'm sure most people even if they don't realize it enjoy in the pokemon tcg so definitely give it a try yeah definitely a cool deck for sure and then yeah as we scroll down we see some thorns and stuff in here um but nothing else is a super standout there's a roaring moon there was a guy who he was on the stream in round number four with an okie yeah. dogie deck he did lose his winning in, unfortunately. Jim O'Brien. Shout outs to Jim O'Brien. I said on the stream he's my new favorite Pokemon player. Taking the Okie Doge, yeah, because he ended like five one two or something. Taking the Okie Doge to that's a that's pretty good for the Doge, to be honest. I actually played with I, I made a build of the deck. The uh oh, I guess he didn't quite make it to the Oh, he end. didn't. Okay, he lost the round before. Hello, pretty close. Um the started deck... four and O. Oh. Yeah, the deck's pretty sick. I tried to I tried to build it with the other day on my stream. Jim Jim inspired me. I was like, okay, now I gotta like try this deck for sure. Did you play the Mr. Mime? No. Or the Mime Jr. I did not play the Mime Jr. Dude, we were trying so hard to figure out what the Mime Jr. is for. Like, what know. is it good against? What is it good against? I mean, it's like theoretically good against Iron Thorns if it That's takes a it, while right? to get your first Dogie set up. Yeah. If they open really weird and slow, you can get some weird attacks off. Like I the first game I played with the deck, I I opened into like I forget what the bench. It was like something in Radiant Greninja. And it was like they had to give me a good attack. And somebody in my chat was like, see, if you played the Mime Jr., it'd be pretty good right here. <laughs> yeah, but... maybe it's just like a good option while your opponent is. No, it's terrible. It's got to be <laughs> terrible. <laughs> no way. Okay, it's definitely a funny option. <laughs> it's a funny option, yeah. But it was really cool. If you haven't seen that round, go watch that Swiss round. It was also funny that it was like, it was Okie Dogie versus Cloth. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely think the cloth player, if he had some mistakes, he could have won for sure. If he had kind of oh, game was, planned a little better. Yeah. In game one, he just had to like attack the Okie Dogie and just like yeah. instead of boss around it. I yeah. think he like forgot that he was like trying to play for like a prize race. And I think he probably he had to have just like forgot that 
he would have KO'd through with poison onto the legacy and gotten yes. a prize card. But even if you didn't, removing the resources was the most important thing to yeah. do there. Yeah, yeah, so. that's what I was saying on the stream too. Like he, uh, I, I think he definitely didn't realize. And then you actually saw in game number two, he picked up and read the legacy energy. Yeah, yeah. Confirmed, that's something. A, a pro tip: read your opponent's cards, pick them up, and read them. You know, if, if you don't you... know for sure, for sure, always just read it. Yeah, always. No shame. Do you do you, you probably read something every single tournament, right? Yeah, either just like confirm an interaction or someone is playing a Mr. Mime Jr. and I'm like, all right, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> what does this exactly do again? Does this it's do? like I I've definitely read the card before, but I got to make sure I know exactly what's. Oh, going he on tied there. Owen Dalgard. <laughs> what what is that deck? Is it, oh, oh, it's Rapagos. Rapagos. You got Dogie's got to get the dubs in that one though. It's weak to fighting. Take him down. True. All right. Well, anything else, Azul, you want to mention, or are you ready to go over recap our predictions from last week? I'll ask into the recap. So our first prediction was how many Duskull would there be in Top Cut? I think we were both assuming with this prediction that Top Cut would be more than eight people. Turned how wrong would we be have eight. been now that you mentioned that how wrong would we have been if it was more than eight because it would have been 17 oh, if it was 17 people in cut dude we would have been so wrong because you guessed 11 i guessed 12 the actual answer was eight there were three duskull in kyle lesnowitz list there were two in sebastian lashmet's list and then there were three in gabe smart's list looks like it would have been eight more if it was 16, asymmetrical. 16. Would have been a lot. That would have been a lot. Yeah, but one of those people maybe wouldn't have been in. <clears throat> what do you mean? Like if... Uh, oh, true, true. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. One of them tied out. Yeah, all right. A little bit more then. Yeah. Um. All right, next prediction was... Who would be the highest place, or what What would be the highest place in Golden Go? Azul had a lot of faith in this deck. He said top 16. I had a little less faith. I had top 32, and it turns out we both should have had less faith because the reality was top 64. Yeah. Is, is that the only Golden Go? No, there's like two Golden Goes in day two, it looks like. Oh, three. Okay. Three Golden Goes in day two. There's actually oh. four. Oh, did I miscount? Yeah, four Golden Go in day two. <clears throat> All right. Then we've got our last prediction was what would Rahul Reddy's final standing be? <laughs> he had been on such a heater and eventually all heaters have to cool down a little bit. And that is what happened for Rahul in this one. Azul predicted that he would change the list and get top four. I predicted he would keep the list, but then cool down to a top 16. The reality is, is that he did keep his list but then cooled way down to a top 128. I'm sure he's not pumped with that one. Probably going to yeah. be replacing that finish. Yes, I don't think he's going to be keeping a 128. <laughs> he doesn't even need that many more finishes to replace it, too. So yeah. he'll be getting replaced soon for sure. Yeah, and now um, the question, I guess like one of the questions would be, will he change the list? I guess I don't know what he's going to next. It might be LAIC. I don't know if he's going to either of the European events. He's got to be going to Little Dude. I th I feel like that group might be locked in on the world tour. Oh, oh, everything? That's a lot of traveling. It is, dude. But they've been to everything so far. True. Run it in. Know. Let's do it. Run it up. Do it all. Also, it kind of like like if that, I did think about that like going into the beginning of the season. Like if I was gonna go to Lil, I would just stay in Europe till Gdansk. Like I was. There's no reason to like leave. Like two weeks like a vacation out of it. Do some sightseeing. Back to back European dubs. Like. <laughs> pretty cool they're just giving out wins over there buddy <laughs> speaking of we do have the little regional championships this weekend so yeah let's just talk about it just a little bit and then we'll do a couple of predictions where do you think lost box fits into the meta now post louisville like if you're someone who has played lost box in the past uh you see this new list you know is it worth picking up and giving it a shot you think it could see success in lil tough yeah because like lost box is definitely way more of a meta call than a broken deck it's not a uh a lugia or even like a raging bolt or reggie drago where it's like they have like stain power in the meta right um there's so many things that can take advantage of lost box like we didn't even mention kiram like there's nothing stopping for any of these decks from playing kiram and then as lost box is like okay do you now include manaphy because i'm sure that's one thing that it was very nice to not have to include because you were expecting to lose to drago anyways and the Palkia matchup is a lot, probably more so, of who Wait, goes first. Should they have? 
most of the dragos don't play cologne anymore right uh i think they do still like if you looked at the lists like the the top four lists played cologne did he okay okay I don't know, you can look through them. I think a lot of people still still include it, even though people aren't playing Manaphy, is like so you have like a it is out. in 0.75% of that yeah. still. Okay. So you have like an out to um or 75%. Yeah, you get to keep an out to like stuff like um I'm like brain farting here. Oh like stall and stuff. You have like a win condition yeah. against stall or pawns or mimicues or whatever. Mimikyu. Um but even just like a turn to attack from Dragapult can be like overwhelming, right? And it's not like you don't have Dreepies on your bench that can get Radiant Greninja turn one. You have Drago V's, right? So you just get a turn two Dragon Ball attack off, and the deck doesn't even have a play away to one hit KO a, Drago, a red Drago V star. So you can just build up the, the potential Dragon Ball to damage. So yeah, the question is like, do you play your own fan- Manaphy in Lost Box? I wouldn't consider teching for Mirror specifically, but like, what about for Kiram's? Are people going to start playing Kiram? I don't think people are going to start playing Kiram, but is, is, what if every Charizard or most Charizards and Dragon Ball players add Manaphy. Is that too much to already consider playing Lost Box? That already sounds like a steep hill to climb is if all the stage two decks start including Manaphy. Because it's not like any of your other matchups are like ridiculously favored. Like your Lugia matchup, I'm sure, is fine. Your um your Lugia matchup, I'm sure, is fine. Your Raging Bolt matchup is favorable. If they have a lot of bravery charms, it becomes a little bit tougher. Like, yeah. Lost Box isn't like some crazy powerful deck that has a ton of staying power on the meta. It was very much a meta call for Louisville. And like moving forward, who didn't play Pheasant Dippity and Draga? What? Are you seeing that? 96%. <laughs> Gotta get the um, Dippy in your Drago list. Back on topic though. <laughs> it's 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 it was a good play for Louisville for sure. Great meta call from uh Davidson and Gang. But moving forward into Lil, it seems fine. Um, I don't think people are going to start teching Kiram's for it until it maybe really pops off. But at that point, you basically can't play the deck, right? Yeah. So it seems fine. And then what does Raging Bolt getting the win in Louisville change about Lil? Um, well, if you're playing Raging Bolt, you should be playing Bravery Charm. I think that's for Three sure. Or Three or four. I honestly think you should be playing four. Probably. Uh, and I think I think this list could have fit four as well, for sure. Yeah. Um, so Caleb could have been playing four, and I think it's probably just it's just, they're just so good. They're just so good in so many matchups. Um, also, learning the matchups to like not just to get the most value out of Bravery Charm, but this does matter a little bit more. But like playing to a smaller board, like if you go, you should go back and people should go back and watch some of Caleb's games throughout his run, and just yeah. the way he bench manages and doesn't just like bench everything turn one. He'll have, he had a lot of situations where he had bolts of, or benches of just like two raging bolts, and that's it. And then found the right turn to go wide, right? You don't want to give your opponent a bunch of prize card options as you kind of develop your board. Um, but I think I think knowing that, knowing that Bravery Charm is the best way to play Raging Bolts, we're going to see a lot more Jamming Towers and Vacuums in everything across the board. Like, Zard will probably add one of those. Reggie Drago might go back to the Jamming Tower. Um, Lugia could definitely play Jamming Tower. Yeah, Lugia could get it back involved as well. So I think it's probably correct to do that. But I think even if everyone has those cards, it's still correct to play for Bravery Charm in your Raging Bolt. So just because we can predict most people are going to have the vacuum of the jamming tower and you probably should play a vacuum or a jamming tower, uh, Raging Bolt should still probably play for Bravery Charm. All right, well, let's make some predictions here, Azul. First one is going to be, what is the highest placing Lost Box? This is so tough because I just don't know. The biggest question I have is like, who's going to play Manaphy? Are, are the stage two decks going to play Manaphy? Because I think that's like the biggest, the biggest opening that Lost Box was able to take advantage of at Louisville. And I don't know if Charizard players are actually going to include Manaphy. So I'm going to go with... And I think a lot of people are actually kind of excited to see Lost Box make its way back. There's a lot of uh, Lost Box enjoyers out there who would love to be playing the deck again and probably play it at Lil. I'm going to go with a top 32. Mm. It's interesting you say that because I was also going to say... <laughs> top 32 and i think that's a, a fair place to put it yeah uh our next prediction what deck will toward play so most recent tournaments toward played charizard to worlds he played control to baltimore and then he played terrapagos to uh dortmund so with the new meta what do you think toward is playing this weekend i know uh, i've already got mine if you want me to go first yeah, you can go first. I think Tord is going to kick it back to Worlds in a deck that he has played a lot, and he's going to go with a Charizard build. 
That is what I was going to say as well. <laughs> We're just I was going to on everything this week. Yeah, I, the first thing I was going to say is I don't think it'll be Terrapagos. I think, um, I feel like Tord has been leaning towards like power heavy decks a lot recently, like trying to have as many options in decks as possible. And he kind of did his Terrapagos build at Dortmund, but Terrapagos is just kind of like a fine deck, and it can't. Its power level is just not that high, and it feels like that's the way. Those are the decks that Tord has been playing at tournaments most recently so he could play the most powerful deck lugia but i don't think tord is a lugia enjoyer so you i'm gonna agree with you with lugia, buddy well sure that's when lugia was ultimate power um <laughs> I, I don't think i don't think tord has been i don't think tord is a lugia enjoyer post broken lugia so i'm gonna agree with you and i think tord is gonna probably play charizard no dust nor because he knows and then final prediction how many players will there be in top cut so what are we assuming how many players will there be at the tournament is one thing yeah um so someone gave me the numbers i think it was 1680 uh, all divisions yeah so that's looking at like probably 1300 masters 150 juniors 150 seniors some no shows around 1300 masters so x2 should be in cut which means once again like i mentioned uh ties are bad you probably want to make a gentleman's if you're trying to be as competitive as optimally competitive as possible you probably want to make ids or gentlemen's agreements as soon as round one just kind of makes sense id should be useless you know go feel feel free to go run a swiss calculator over on limitless to just kind of see the numbers yourself definitely go do that um so assuming x2 does make cut i'm gonna go with dude i just want to see it man i'm gonna go 16. i want to see a top 16 mm -hmm. like a clean top 16 does go with 16. I think less people is more conducive to there being a smaller cut though, right? Oh boy. Hey, let me run it. I'll run the numbers real fast. Nope, too late. You've already locked it in. You're saying 16. <laughs> I'm gonna go with nine like, on this one. Yeah, the way you said that, I was like, is that even possible? You're right. Let's see. Yeah. 1300. Where should I put the tie right at? 11. Uh, 11. Okay, let's see what it says. You're right. <sighs> I'm saying not too many. Well, no. Hang on. How, how high of a tie rate do I need for it to get really funky? Do like 14. That's probably yeah. the highest we would see would be like 14. to 15. Okay. If we can get a 15% tie rate, 29 point players make cut, but uh, still not very many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's because there's 1,300 yeah, people just, in the There's just not enough players. Yeah, I didn't think yeah. about it hard enough. So, yeah, it's going to be around. It's not going to be very much. You can change your answer. I mean, the answer is nine. <laughs> I just <laughs> looked it up. I mean, it could be eight. It, it could, could be, be eight. It could be 10. It could be 11. Uh, Unlikely, but it is true. Depending on the tie rate, it could be uh, a little bit more. I'm going with nine. as well. Dude, we literally had the same answer for all three predictions. Yeah, we have to lock I just want 16, but yeah, if you actually just run the math, it's like not possible. <laughs> yeah. Unless the tie rate was just like really 30%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone um, plays so slow. It's lock in nine then overall. All right. Well, those are our predictions. We'll recap them next week. If you're interested in checking out, Lil, be sure to check out the official stream, not a Zool stream. I'm just kidding. You could also check out my stream as well. It'll be there. I know. I'm kidding. <laughs> all, all ways to watch Pokemon are good. And that's really all that Pokemon cares about as well is that people are watching the game. So. Yep. I and just care that be... if I'm on stream that people are, are watching me. me over you <laughs> <Yeah>. for sure. <laughs> and the stream goes live at 1 a.m. Uh, Pacific. <laughs> so I think they start around sooner, though. I think the, usually the European streams, they start around like two or three. So we'll get like an extra round of day one, which I might sleep in a little bit later and skip that round. But we'll see. I'm going to try and be up on time. Um, the matches probably won't start till around like 2 a.m. There's usually like a what 30, 45 minute ish pre-show and all that stuff happening. So um, it's usually supposed to be around. It's supposed to be around like 15 minutes. It definitely runs longer than that. Nah. Like on average, Dude, don't make me go. I'm gonna go pull up Louisville Wait, did, right now. We had technical issues. I think at the start of the show this week. Well, no, like the stream starts at. The stream's um, supposed to start the the 15 minute countdown starts at 12. Yeah, and yeah. That's at twelve fifteen, we have the pre-show, and then at twelve thirty, we're supposed to have our first round. That's like yeah, what so, the schedule says. So it is like thirty minutes then, because of the the fifteen minute countdown. Well, that are you, oh, why are that... you counting that in anything? 
Well, I'm just saying the the, the stream start time is like oh 12, sure, but sure, then sure. yeah, there's 15 minute countdown plus that. That's what I'm basing it off. I was like, I see. I know I don't have to be there immediately at 12 because it's like 30 minutes until the round actually goes up. Yeah, starts. All right, so maybe 1:30 then. 1:30 is what you should shoot for if you're trying to tune in. <sighs> All right. Well, I think that is gonna do it for us this week. Unless you've got anything else you want to say, Azul. Nope. Oh, send us out. Thanks a bunch to everyone for listening and for your support. As always, if you do enjoy, be sure to leave us a like, a review, a comment, a rating. All those things go a long way and help us out a bunch and help more people discover this podcast. If you want to stay up to date with what's going on in our lives and also with the podcast, the best place to do it is over on X. You can follow myself at Chip Ritchie. Azul at Azul G uh, Azul underscore GG. And then you can follow the podcast at Uncommon underscore energy. Appreciate the support as always. Catch y'all next week, 7 a.m. Eastern.